Hey guys, how you doing? Good to see you again. Glory to the Father, glory to the Son, glory to the Holy Spirit. In Jesus Almighty name, we have Rafa, we have Rafa Paul. I'm liking the beard, but it's going to get too thick, so I'm going to have to trim it. Uh, pray, man, the allergies are killing me, kicking my aspirations. So I had to take Claritin D, and it's now bad weather. I need to keep working out. So do pray for my discipline. I really cherish your prayers. Do pray for my discipline. Ask the Lord to grant me miraculous, perfect self-control, self-restraint, self-constraint, control my passions, to empower me to engage in intense spiritual disciplines and physical ones, to stay doing intense cardio and stay on my eating. By the grace of God, my next cheat day, I'm trying to shoot for when I see 199. By the power of the Holy Spirit, I need his grace to get healthier and fit and use my health to glorify Jesus Christ so I can be healthy enough to see my daughters grow up, if the Lord is pleased. I don't have health insurance. I don't have a doctor. I'm trusting in my Lord. So pray for me. I see. I feel like I'm getting leaner, but these two days, because of my allergies and the weather, I haven't been able to get into cardio. Pray I can do that. Glory to the Father, the Holy Spirit. So please pray. Pray my daughters, the Lord keeps them safe, secure, protected, that they fall in love with Jesus. And I die in their arms if the Lord tarry. So pray for me. Need your prayers. We're going to have a lot of fun today. Asking the Holy Spirit again to be our teacher. Remember, I'm going to repeat this till I die or until the Lord returns. You are not my disciples. Don't ever give anyone the impression you're my disciples. Don't let anyone insult you and say you are Shemunians. You don't need to de defend me if people attack me because they think I'm a heretic. So let me remind you. They think I'm a heretic, who cares? I'm not their judge and not my judge. If they slander me, that's a different story. If they accuse me of some immoral behavior, that's a different story. You see, but if someone attacks me, calls me a heretic, who cares, man? One man's saint is another man's heretic. So you are not doing yourselves a favor, nor are you doing me a favor when... You then send me clips of people calling me a heretic. You're only making me sin in my heart, and you're a stumbling block. Nor are you doing yourself a favor by going around defending me because you're going to have the reputation of being a Shemunian. Be like Protestant believer. Me and him go back to Paltok days. He hates to love me, and I love to hate him. So me and him are homies. But he doesn't need to defend me, and I definitely don't defend him. In fact, if I had a chance, I'd throw him under the bus. But, you know, I can't. He's been one of the loyal brothers. Actually, if you guys don't know, Paraz Believer is one of the loyal group. He goes way back, 2000, 2001. That's how far back we go. He was there in Pal Talk when we started. We actually used to do rooms in Pal Talk. Christian Prince began there. I began there. And yet, sadly, some of our brothers and sisters have left us, but they're now with the Lord Jesus. You remember Seeker, Protestant Believer? Millie Fiori, they all have left us. You know who I would like to know about her whereabouts? You remember Ice T Girl, Protestant believer from Paltok? You remember Ice T Girl? She used to be on Paltok all the time. She was a lioness. She used to destroy Muslims. And you remember Sarah? Thank you, Brother Jay. Pray I get leaner and leaner. What, whatever happened to them? They disappeared, huh? Ice T girl and Sarah. Millie Fiore went to be with the Lord. Man, but man, Seeker went to be with the Lord. But anyway, we have a lot to discuss today. It's going to be about Calvinism. It's going to be about Calvinism. So I'm going to go after Anthony Rogers. I'll try to keep it professional. By the way, you know he's manifesting. I'm living in his head and I own his head by the decree of his God. Because on his channel and don't make it go viral in fact if you guys really love the lord you need to unsubscribe from his channel he's a liar he's a deceiver he's a charlatan he's not a scholar he doesn't quote accurately he doesn't understand what he quotes he parrots and he gets caught in misinterpretation miscitation and lies we've documented it everything i'm saying has been documented and so this man is not responsible he's not a man of integrity he's not a christian in my book may god forgive me and not punish me nor do i consider james white a christian i think they're too venomous too poisonous 
too demonized, too arrogant to be considered Christians. May God have mercy on me and that heals me and destroys the beams in my eyes. Anyway. I saw that he put a seven-minute clip, again attacking the Roman Catholic Church. This time, the title is something about Rome versus the biblical trinity. Again, why this man is truly of the devil, why I have no respect for him anymore. And I thank the Lord for exposing him because he's still a criminal. May God rebuke and chasten him to repent before it's too late. He's attacking. I didn't watch the clip, but the title says it all. He's attacking the Roman Catholic Church. I don't know. On what grounds? In light of biblical Trinitarianism. For the record, for the record, he is not a biblical Trinitarian. I need you to listen here. When the class begins, respect the rules. Okay? Respect the rules. Help me to help you. Please stay focused. Let the Spirit work through me. He's not a biblical Trinitarian. You know why? Because if you ask him, do you believe there are two natures in Christ? Do you believe in the hypostatic union? Are you a diophysite? Do you affirm diatheletism? Two wills in Christ, two natures in Christ, one person? If he says yes, he's not a biblical Trinitarian because you cannot derive those from Scripture. I need you to listen to this. You can establish from Scripture the Father is God in an absolute sense. The Son is God in an absolute sense. The Holy Spirit is God in an absolute sense. And they're not three gods. And at the same time, the Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Spirit. The Spirit is not the Father. Listen, you can also establish that Jesus is not just God, but man. But to then argue, because Christ is God in flesh, that means two natures instead of a composite nature. These two natures are so inseparably united in one person that you speak of composite nature or that he has two wills. You cannot prove that from Scripture. You can't. That's a lie. So he is stealing the heritage of the ancient church. He is stealing the heritage, the creedal formulation statements of Christians who would condemn him as a heretic and never allow him to step foot in the church. Because those ancient Christians believed in Mary's perpetual virginity, her purity, believed in intercession of saints, believed in prayers for the dead, believed in a priesthood, believed the Eucharist is the flesh and blood of Christ, believed in water baptismal regeneration. So this is why he is a disgusting pig and a tool of Satan, a liar and a thief. He will argue <clears throat> the Trinity along creedal formulations, which he cannot defend from Scripture. But then the very men who gave him these formulations he will throw under the bus because he's his own pope. He is the bastard seed of John Calvin. You understand? So, brethren, anytime anyone tells you two natures in Christ, two wills, they're not basing it on Scripture alone. They're lying to you or they're ignorant. All right, don't change the subject, please. I'm going to get you out of here. Because from Scripture, let me repeat. I need you to listen because this is class. May the Lord bless our numbers. From Scripture, you can establish the Father is Yahweh God. The Son is Yahweh God. The Holy Spirit is Yahweh God. Father is not Son. Son is not Spirit. Spirit is not the Father. And the Son is also man. All of that you can establish clearly, irrefutably. As you see, I demonstrate the truth of the Trinity by the grace of God's Spirit from the Bible. But to tell me how the two natures of Christ work and one person, and whether they have three wills or one will, you're now going beyond Scripture, and now you're borrowing the collateral or stealing the collateral of the early church. Are you with me there? Are we going to focus? You understand? So is it ironic this spiritual bastard of John Calvin will attack the Roman Catholic Church and then think he's a biblical Trinitarian when his ancestors were Catholics and he's deriving much of his philosophical, theological terminology, speculation from the Catholic Church and her rebellious daughters because the Protestants are daughters of Rome. And I don't say Rome in a derogatory term. 
All his theological tradition comes out of Catholicism. The Protestants came out of Catholicism. And by the way, to show you how evil and wicked the reformers were, go rewatch the series that Lloyd Dion did with me. This is a fact. The Protestants were such bastards, they actually tried to help the Turks, the Muslims, to destroy the Catholic Church. But glory to the triune God, the Catholic Church stood. In fact, if it was not for the Catholic Church, for example, in the Battle of Vienna or Lepanto, Anthony's ancestors would have been raped by Muslims and he would have the blood of Muslims running in his veins. Do you know that? So this spiritual bastard seed of John Calvin is indebted to the Catholic Church from protecting his female ancestors for being raped by Muslims so that he wouldn't be the spawn of Muslims who sired him and have their blood in his veins. But again, he's an ungrateful bastard who bites the hand that has fed him. You know that? And ironically, one of his monikers was Charles Martel. Does anyone know the significance of Charles Martel? Anyone know what the cigarette? He go, in fact, on Peltak, he used to be called Charles Martel. Anyone know the significance of Charles Martel? Do you remember that? Protestant believer when Anthony used to come on, Paltuk, his name was Charles Martel. Who's Charles Martel? Check him out. Check out what he did. Google it right now, Jerby. Charles Martel. Who was he and what did he do to push back the onslaught of the Catholic, uh, of Islam on the West? Who stopped the Muslims, because they already reached to Spain, from taking over Europe? Google it right now. Figure it out. Say it again. Charles Martel, the hammer. What did he do? Here you go, Val Valerian. God bless you, brother. You are very educated. The Lord preserve you. And may he help me to stay humble and, and honor you as a brother in Christ. Charles Martel won the Battle of Tours in the 8th century. Now, do you think Charles Martel was a Protestant or a Catholic? So you see what kind of ungrateful spiritual bastard he is? He used to go by the name Charles Martel, who's a Catholic whom the triune God used to defeat the Muslims and stop them from advancing and taking over Europe. You see why he's a bastard? That was his nick. Charles Martel the hammer. That was his nick. Glory to the Father, Son, Holy Spirit for preserving the Catholic Church and from the Catholic Church raising up these warriors in the battlefield because Anthony's ancestors would have been raped by Muslims. That was his nick. See why I said the Lord's going to expose him? And I'm now going to do a series to expose him. Charles the Hammer Martel defeated the Muslims at the Battle of Tours in 732. The Moorish king was killed in the battle. He got the name the Hammer because of how badly he defeated the Muslims. Guess what? He wasn't Protestant. Guess what? In the 8th century, he would have been Catholic. So you see what an ungrateful, wicked bastard spawn of John Calvin is? He called himself Charles Martel because he acknowledges that God used Charles Martel to defeat the Muslims, stopping the advancement of Islam into Europe so that his woman folk would not have been molested by them. But now he's attacking their own Catholic Church that spared this bastard's ancestry. You see? What did I say the Lord will do to people when he's fed up with them? When you are disgusting and arrogant and full of pride, the Lord will hand you over and humiliate you and make you the laughing stock of the world. And that's happening, James White, which I will be discussing as well. So I'm starting a series where I'm going to go after Anthony on his limited atonement. And why limited atonement? Limited atonement is the Achilles heel of Calvinism. Do you know that the first step to leaving Calvinism, this is a fact, the first step that causes many, not all, it's not always the case, leave Calvinism is when they see limited atonement is not biblical, it's a lie. Then that gets you to now start rethinking Calvinism. That's my own experience. And I'm going to explain what limited atonement is because it's part of the series in a minute. But when I saw that the scripture did not support 
limited atonement. Did not support limited atonement. I lost faith in the L and Tulip. And I'll explain that in a minute. Just be patient with me. The L and Tulip. And then I started questioning all the other aspects until finally, by the power and mercy of the Holy Spirit illuminating me, I saw the entire system is a lie from the pit of hell. Right? So this is why the coward wants to take a shot at me that I said Jesus died for Satan. But I'm calling him out to debate me on limited atonement. Let's see if this champion, this paper tiger, can defend this doctrine of Satan. Okay? Once that goes, you start questioning things. So you got it now? Yep, now. I found out that it was in 1683 at the Battle of Vienna, again, thanks to the Catholic Church, right, that that's when they started baking croissants in honor of the defeat of the moon otheists. And by the way, I didn't invent the term monotheists. I got to give credit where credit is due. Someone else came up with the word calling Muslims monotheists. So because, remember, their pagan fast begins. When does it begin? When they see the crescent moon. When does it end? When the crescent moon reappears. So guess what they did to celebrate their destruction and humility? They started baking croissants shaped like a crescent moon, devouring it as a way of mocking them, being devoured by the soldiers of Christ. Ha, <laughs> ha, so next time on my stream, I'm going to eat some croissants. I'm going to eat some croissants. So there you go. So isn't it ironic? Isn't it ironic? Irony of ironies, right? That this spiritual bastard seed of John Calvin used to call himself Charles Martel. <laughs> And now it's come to bite him in his oversized fat ass cheeks. <laughs> Our God is good. May the Lord grant me perfect health, spiritually, emotionally, psychologically, physically for many years. And serve the Lord with honor until I die. Let's begin. Because I got some juicy clips. Because it's about Calvin and his spawn. But I need you to focus. I need you to help me to help you. You know the rules. We're not going to ask irrelevant questions. We're not going to start attacking me or my mods or anyone in the comment section thinking you're pious and spiritual and holy and better than us, which shows that you're an arrogant narcissist. You're not going to start dating and ask people to marry you here. And you're not going to go on tangents and start making jokes like Pita and Lolita and Loli, like the other day that happened with Ryan, who now is not showing up because he feels embarrassed. All because of Nina 75, all because of her sin. Okay. Stephen, can you please join the Shia with your mother and get the lot of here before I bring the Shia to spit on you? So we're going to focus, right? We're going to focus. You're going to let the Holy Spirit work through me. And this is a class. You're going to engage me. Don't ask the relevant questions because I see and then you distract me and I got issues. Okay. So if you ask irrelevant questions, I'm going to get you out of here, Eric. You're going to respect. You're going to respect the rules. If you don't respect the rules, that means you're here as a spawn of Satan. You want me to humiliate you. If you don't respect us, we don't respect you. All right. Respect the rules. This is a class. Let the spirit speak. All right. And may the Lord destroy the beams in our eyes. Hypocrisy from us and not live double lives and not be double minded, but practice what we preach. I pray that for myself because my strength is in the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, I will not make it. So may he purge us in his purifying fire. Glory to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So let's pray. And then we got a lot because part of my discussion, I'm going to play some clips. A young professor at Northwest Seminary has made James White lose the few brain cells that he has left. Because he's actually a bona fide scholar of biblical linguistics. He's a scholar of the Greek Septuagint. He teaches biblical languages, specifically Greek. He did a review of the debate between <clears throat> Leighton Flowers and James White. And glory to the Father, Son, and Spirit. He confirmed what I said a while back. If you remember my discussion with that young pastor, I believe his name was J.D. I forgot his name. 
about faith and how I kept schooling him about trying to appeal to scholars and tenses of verb because the Greek language was a living language. I'm talking about Koine Greek. And the tenses of verbs are fluid. And I did a session explaining that when you try to take the Greek New Testament and then you try to parse every single verb or noun or grammatical construction, you are overdoing it because the last thing that the apostles or the writers were thinking is, hmm, let me use the aorist here or let me use the perfect tense or let me use the imperfect or the blue perfect because later on they're going to parse my words. No, they were speaking as guided by the spirit. So language is flexible so that people can use different tenses of verbs synonymously. I said that if you go back. Here's a linguist who was taught by Donald Carson and others. Donald Carson was a Calvinist, still is. And this man left Calvinism. And he did a session showing why James White is a charlatan, doesn't know Greek. As I've been saying, I'm going to play clips. You're going to see how the Lord is truly destroying James White's ministry. But I'm going to give us a warning, a warning for myself. Okay. I'm going to play clips. You're going to see it. Okay. But I'm going to give us a warning. Let me give, let me get the scriptures lined up. We have to be careful. And if you truly love me for the sake of the Lord, you're going to pray that the Lord doesn't have me over. The Holy Spirit seals me and fills me that I don't shame the Lord Jesus so that he can then discipline me. Because remember, God guard our height, hearts. We're not better than them. It's a fact. We can fall like them. That's my fear. And I trust the Lord not to give me what I deserve. So I'm going to give you a word of exhortation as a reminder to me. Okay. I want you to see this. All right. Let me just do this. Let me line them up. The scriptures. We're going to use legacy, and the reason why it's because it uses a form of the divine name. Okay. Okay. Ready? Let me just do something real quick. May the Lord give me perfect recall of every jot, tittle portion of scripture. Destroy forgetfulness. Destroy confusion and agitation. And perfect these gifts in me to use them to glorify the Lord. Let me just do something real quickly. All right. So watch here. Okay. You ready? Let me go back here. All right. Screen share. We ready? A reminder, because I'm going to play clips. We're going to pray. Class has begun. And Lord willing, later on, I'm going to be on Praise the I Am's channel to help him destroy Sean Griffin. Okay. But I need you to listen. Please respect the rules. Let's make it enjoyable. I don't want to keep coming and insulting dogs who have no respect for my channel. All right. So I'm liking the beard. The only thing is I need to get it trimmed. I'm liking the beard. That was the only good thing, man. Well, to be honest, my ex-wife, she didn't trim my beard. But anyway. All right. Now, anyway, let's see. Let me enlarge it. Go here. I'm liking the beard, Sam. But, you know, I need to trim because it's going to be over my mouth. I and mean, when I eat, I'm going to start eating my, you know, my beard. You know, and it's not that tasty. It's very salty because I'm a salty person. <laughs> so funny. I forgot to laugh. <laughs> Get it? If I don't trim it, then my mustache will be over my mouth and I'll be eating my, my mustache. And it's very salty because I'm a salty person. <laughs> a reminder. Proverbs 24, 17, 18. When your enemy falls, Proverbs 24, 17, 18. Holy Spirit, perfect my recall of every jot to the portion of scripture. Strengthen my throat, my heart, my lungs, my chest with the health I need and discipline to get healthier. And use my health to serve your church and glorify our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and give us the greatest gifts in your sight. Perfect faith in our God, hope in our God, love for our God. Purge our tongues, never betray or deny or shame or blaspheme the Lord Jesus Christ. But be doers of the word, even unto death, and fill us with your fruit and rebuke Satan. Purify us, cleanse us, our loved ones, my daughters and mother, in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, and seal and own us and own this ministry and close the door of censorship. We trust in you and we love you, Holy Spirit. You are the teacher. For the glory of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Okay. Proverbs 24, 17 to 18. Proverbs 24, 17, 18. When your enemy falls, do not be glad. And when he stumbles, do not let your heart rejoice. Lest Yahweh seize it, and it be evil in his eyes, and turn his anger away from him. 
ask the Lord Jesus to purify our hearts, purge our hearts and our motives, that our hatred for these men will not allow us to then sin against God. Did you catch it? Do you see it? Proverbs 24, 17, 18. May the Lord seal and etch his words in our hearts and our minds and our tongues and our souls and our spirits to love the word, live out the word and meditate on it. See? And then Romans 12, 16 to 20, 21. May the Holy Spirit fill us as he filled Paul. Romans 12, 16 to 21. <clears throat> what happened Romans 12, dude? What the heck, mister? Okay, why didn't it come up? Hmm. Romans 12. Is there something wrong? You all know it's got to be here. What happens, dude? Oh, no matter what you do. All right. Romans 12, 16 to 21. By being of the same mind toward one another, we have to have the same attitude. Not being haughty in mind. Don't be arrogant and proud. Now, I love this part, but associating with the humble. You see what Paul says? Don't be so arrogant and proud. That when you see someone who is humble, maybe poor, doesn't have the finer things of life, doesn't dress well, doesn't <clears throat> live in the most expensive homes, don't be so arrogant and look down at that person, associate with such people, fellowship with such people, love such people, build them up, right? That's what it says here. Are you catching it? Get rid of all the trolls. You see how beautiful our Bible is? Our Bible is historically accurate, inspired, and it's the revelation of the heart of the true God, who's Father, Son, and Spirit. Jesus calls us to conform to his image, to act like him, behave like him, and love like him. Jesus, who's influent and rich, humbled himself to be born in a poor household. So you who live in fancy homes and have fancy cars, how dare you think you're too good to go hang out with someone who's not as financially well or dresses as well as you? Shame on you. You don't have the spirit of Christ. How dare you wear $3,000 suits and Rolexes or have Gucci purse, whatever it is, flaunt it to make these people who don't have feel more insecure and feel a lot worse about themselves. Instead of taking that money and helping them and loving them, may we practice what we preach. You see? Isn't that beautiful? Our Lord, who is God, infinitely rich, humble himself to be born in a home of a poor carpenter. Who are you to think you're better? And practice what you preach, brethren. Because there are some of you who know yourselves. Some of you live in mansions. Some of you have three, four cars. Some of you can afford to eat in five-star restaurants. And all you associate with people like you. All you associate with is people who are as rich and affluent as you. That's not what Jesus did. May we be like Jesus and practice what we preach. And I pray I practice what I preach. We need to be like the Lord. Go and find the poor. Go spend time with them. Help them out financially. Feed them. Clothe them. Invite them to your homes. Now, again, be wise as snakes, innocent as doves. You're not dumb and gullible, so don't let them leech on you. Don't, because there are a lot of wolves who are poor, and a lot of people who are poor in the streets is because they're addicted to drugs. I'm not saying be stupid, but there are people who are struggling to make ends meet. Jesus came for those people. You understand? We have to practice what we preach. We cannot just talk a good talk, but not go. And I pray for this for myself. Go visit soup kitchens, homeless shelters. Ask your church to have a food pantry. Contribute. Go do your part. Jesus said, you'll always have the poor, but care for the poor. In fact, in Matthew 25, 31 to 46. Matthew 25, 31 to 46. If you read it, Jesus says he's going to judge you by the love you showed or you, or you did not show to those in need. He says, I was hungry, you fed me. I was thirsty, you gave me to drink. Or I was hungry, you did not feed me. Brethren, if all of us pull our money together, we would be able to alleviate the financial suffering of many brothers and sisters in Christ. Locally, 
in close proximity and all over the world. May we practice what we preach. Right? You see why I say, Holy Spirit, fill us the way you filled Paul. Because that power you gave Paul to be like Jesus, we want to be like Jesus, not for the praise of men. Now, there's a context to everything. Praise I am. All right, brother. So we'll be on tonight. Now, remember, praise I am. Please be strict. I'm there to help you to go through those clips. Do not allow trolls to come and distract us. All right, brother? I want to come and help you and sharpen you, brother. All right. Never paying back evil for evil to anyone. Respecting what is good in the sight of all men. Now watch. If possible, here's a condition. So far as it depends on you being at peace with all men. Meaning, if it's up to you and you're able to, right, be at peace with everyone. But remember, at times, it's not up to us. I don't want animosity, antagonism. I don't want verbal assaults and attacks. If it's up to me, I would just teach and refute arguments and not involve personalities. Sometimes it's not up to you. It's beyond your control. Sometimes, though you seek peace, there are those who seek to bring chaos, disunity, and violence. That's when you have to be men, lions, and you have to be lionesses and destroy those obstacles to peace. So there's a condition here. Notice the condition. If it's possible and it's up to you in your control, be at peace with all men. Go later on. I'm going to be with par Praise the I Am, refuting Sean Griffin on the Trinity. Jesus being out. You, ca you catch it here? But if there are people who are dividing the flock, harming the flock, bringing disunity, you need to put them in their place, silence them, and remove them. You have to be then warriors, a time for everything. Okay? Never taking your own revenge, beloved, instead of leave room for the wrath of God, which is what I've done with my ex-wife and Martin Simon Yako. I'm allowing the Lord to avenge me for what she did to my daughters, where I can't be with them, because I don't want to sin in my heart and do something stupid and shame the Lord and end up in prison. This is why God in his wisdom had me leave the state, because he knew if I was in the same st state, that Jezebel, wicked, adulterous daughter of Satan, sadly the mother of my kids, would have tempted me but God, who loves me, is protecting me. And I know I will see his vengeance on her for what she did to my daughters. Not to me. If I didn't have daughters with her, I don't care what she does. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, watch here. Watch here. But if your enemy is hungry, do you kick him in the mouth? Feed him. And if he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heat burning coals on his head. You know what that means? Let's break it down. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Holy Spirit, give us the power to practice these words as Paul tried to, by your power, by your strength for the glory of Jesus. Let me explain that part. For in so doing, you will heat burning coals on his head. Yep, Romans 8, 28. You know what that means? It can mean one of two things. That when you show kindness to your enemy when he's fallen, and here, I'll give you an example. Praise I am. I extended an invitation to help him sharpen his defense of the deity of Christ against the heretic. In that, I heat burning coals on his head. You know why? Because it humbled him and convicted him to realize he was wrong for going on Anthony's channel and slandering me. That's the point of Paul. You see it? So I'm just using it as an illustration. When you show your enemy kindness, in spite of what he or she did to you, the Spirit will use that to humble that person, break that person, and shame that person into feeling regret for what they did to you. It can also mean that when you show kindness to your enemy, in spite of how they treat you, you will only bring greater judgment upon them on the day of judgment. You understand? Do you catch it? And you see it with praise I am. Why do you think praise I am got humbled when just the day before he was on Anthony, allowing Anthony to slander me? Because when I saw his debate with Sean Griffin, I told Donnie, contact him, and I emailed him so I can help him. 
So he understands it's not personal. I don't hate him. My problem with him is not personal. It's not. So here, you see, yeah, I was over there. You catch it? He is now experiencing verse 20, Romans 12, 20. You're seeing it in front of your eyes. And I'm not boasting, God destroy my pride and arrogance. I'm not. I'm giving you an example in real time that when you do it the Bible's way, you can never go wrong because God knows you better than you know yourself. And he knows what works and he knows what doesn't work. Get Paul out of here, please. Uh, Paul Ross, you got to go, brother. Get him out of here. Paul, make sure you say hi to Mike Winger. Those who try to pretend to know Greek. Brother, can you get out of here now? Don't come back. I just said about people who think they know Greek and fail to realize that words can be used synonymously. Paul, do not come back to my channel because I'm going to cuss you out. Now you're causing me to stumble. Lord, have mercy on you. Mike Winger will help you. Don't come back, Paul. Please. Ooh, these people don't learn. He wants to sound intelligent with the Greek he doesn't know. So that's what kills me. They think they know Greek. Oh, by the way, I'm screen sharing, right? Yes, I just want to make sure. All right. These guys that think they know Greek, that's what's killing me. And I'm going to play the clips there. Try it God's way. Now, can I give you more biblical counsel that I need you to pray for me to practice what I preach? More biblical advice? Because that's why you come here, wanting the Spirit to work through me to go into a variety of topics with clarity by the mercy of the Holy Spirit. Watch the warning of Scripture. Because God knows us better than we do, and the Bible is His manual. Watch here. Man, I love this. Here's who you should avoid, though, okay? Watch here. Proverbs 15.1. Proverbs 15.1. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. You see that? See, if that fat slob, Calvin's spiritual bastard, Dodgers, hadn't said the Roman whore, I would not have attacked him and insulted him because he was raised by whores. So he thinks everyone's a whore. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. By way of testimony. Now, guys, please focus. I'm going to say the Lord's Prayer begin. It's a lot of meat. When my ex-wife used to verbally bash me, I said, why don't you try Proverbs 15, verse 1? See if a gentle answer will work. She goes, well, why don't you try it? You're the Christian, right? I go, exactly. I go, you just proved my point. You should try it. You're the Christian, right? See, then you know you're dealing with narcissists, and you just got to let God deliver you, which he did. You catch it? A gentle, gentle answer turns away wrath. But a harsh word stirs up anger. Catch it? When a person is going to respond that way, you're wasting your time. So then what do you do? Watch here. What do you do? Watch here. The wisdom of our Lord. A hot-tempered man stirs up strife, but the slow to anger quiets a dispute. You see how beautiful and rich God's wisdom is? Tell me you're not blown away with how deep this Bible is. Yeah, get David out of here. Anyone who asks irrelevant questions, they are whores and bastards. They have no respect for the, my channel. Get them out of here. I don't want them here. Lord, help us be content with one. My channel's not going to take off because I have to get rid of people who think this is just here to chat and socialize. A hot-tempered man stirs up strife, but the slow to anger quiets the dispute. You see how beautiful that is? See? Now watch. Look at the advice our Lord gives us. A man's insight makes him slow to anger. If you think about the reflection, hold on. If I lose my temper, then this will result in this. If I do something in anger, I may harm someone irreparably. I may go to jail. I may discredit my testimony. And it is his honor to overlook a transgression. You understand what that means? Can I give you practical advice? There have been men who have been wronged by their wives. If I tell you some horror stories besides my own, okay? If I tell you what some women and brothers in Christ, people I know, what their wives have done to them and what the judges have done to them, tempting them to get violent and take matters into their own hands where they would end up in jail and also losing their children, right? But this is what Proverbs says. 
it is to your honor to overlook a transgression. Better you accept that sin than let it simmer in your heart, causing you to get violent and lose your passion because you're going to end up in a worse predicament. You know that? I've shared this. I'm going to share it again. I know a close friend of mine. I can't mention his name. He's got four beautiful daughters. He was married to someone whom he thought was faithful, and she claimed to be a Christian. Another wicked Jezebel that makes my ex-wife look like she's a choir girl. For the first six years of his marriage, she was having an affair with a man that she was dating before she married him, and he didn't know. It came out years later. But then she stopped the affair with that man, and she started having an affair with a 16-year-old boy who was a son of a couple we knew from the church. She started having sex with him, a young boy, until he was 24. And two years ago, she got caught. Now they're in a divorce. And yet still, the judge ordered him, because he's with his kids in the home, she moved out, yet the judge still orders him to pay her at the start of the month $1,500. Where is the justice in that? Pray that God will vindicate him. Now, these are the kind of things that will drive a man to insanity. Daniel, stay focused. Your mother's a whore. Tell your mother, Daniel Weaver, stop being a whore because people are gossiping about her. She's a whore. Daniel, and you're a whore, and you're a son of a whore. So go back to your whore mother, you dirty whore. So these are the kind of things that will drive a man to murder. But this is the wisdom of God. Okay? This is the wisdom of God. A man's insight makes him slow to anger. Think about it before you react emotionally. And it is to his honor to overlook a transgression. Do you understand the wisdom? I'm giving you actual practical applications. All right? You catch it? The wisdom here. Because to know that what, that's what has been done to you since marriage, and you have four girls, and then you have a judge telling you you have to pay her $1,500 at the start of the month, right? To know it will make any man lose his sanity and go violent. But this is what the Bible is saying. Think. Don't react emotionally. Don't go by your emotions. Because if you do, you lose your children and your life in prison. So that's why it says it's your honor to overlook a transgression, which is why Paul said, let the Lord avenge. Let the Lord avenge. Daniel Weaver, did you find your whore mother, that filthy whore? She gave birth to you when she did muta with ten shia, you bastard. You filthy scum lowlife. You think you're a Christian. Go weave yourself out of your mother's prostitution. Glory to the Father and Spirit. Now, Proverbs 19, 19. You ready? Watch here the wisdom. The Bible's beautiful, right? And by the way, G26, it's in several states. I thought Illinois is bad. The brother's going through hell in another state. And I know another brother. You should see what that judge do in another state. The system is set up to destroy men. Not saying all men are angels. Some deserve it. Proverbs 19.19. 19. A man of great wrath will bear the penalty. Now watch the wisdom. For if you deliver him, you will only have to do it again. You see the wisdom? When you know there's a man or a woman who's full of rage, and she cannot be controlled, he cannot be controlled, you're wasting your time delivering them because you're going to constantly deliver them and you're going to enable them. Wash your hands of them. See that? You see that right there? Tell me this Bible is not beautiful. A man of great wrath will bear the penalty. And for if you deliver him, you will only have to do it again. Isn't that amazing wisdom from our Lord? He's telling you what to do with such people. You're wasting your time. You deliver once, you're going to do it again and again and again. 
You caught it? All right. Now watch here. I scale. Okay, I got to go with Proverbs 1632. I should have done that first. He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty. And he who rules his own spirit, than he who captures a city. Why? Because when you let your emotions control you, then you wreak havoc and do damage, consequences of which you cannot escape. So it is better to be able to control your passions by the strength supplied by the Spirit than control a city. If you can't control your passions, then you're not fit to rule because you'll be rash, impulsive, and you're going to make decisions based on your emotions what will do damage to you and others around you. So learn by the Spirit to rule your emotions. Rule your passions. That is the true warrior. Boy, I'm far from that. You see that? You see what it says? You know when you are a master and a ruler? When you master and control your emotions and are not controlled by them. Pray for me. I can get to that point. Control my passions. Anger, rage, lust, food addiction. That's when you know you are a conqueror. When you rule your passions and are not controlled by them. See? Proverbs 16, 32. Tell me the Bible is not beautiful. Honestly, when I take the moment and show you the wisdom of Scripture, are you not blown away? Proverbs 22, 24, 25. And here seals the deal. Do you believe the Bible? Do you trust God's wisdom? If you say yes, let's act upon it. Let's act upon it. Let's practice what we preach. So here's advice. Do not befriend a man of anger. Get them out of your life. You're not God. You're not their savior. You cannot heal them. Why are you friends with angry people? Do not come along with a man of great wrath. These people, get them out of your life. Lest you learn his ways and take on a snare against your soul. There you go. What more do you want? Advice from our Lord, your Lord and mine. Do not associate with people of anger or people of great wrath because then they're going to cause you to get angry and be wrathful and then you're going to do things that you will regret later on. So let us practice God's word because he knows what's best for us. You can't save them. You're not their savior. You can't deliver them. You can't even deliver yourself. Don't deceive yourself. And this goes with this advice. I hope you're appreciating these moments. Unlike Dan Weaver, whose whore mother is busy doing muta with the Shia, that slut. You stupid bastard. And you think you're a Christian. Here you go. These guys who think they're Christians. Proverbs 15, 33 here. This is what it says. Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. That's it in a nutshell. 1 Corinthians 15, 33. So working with them is different than socializing with them and doing activities around them. You can't avoid not working with them. That's different. Love you, Mr. Han. I miss you, brother. I'm glad you're one of my mods and regulars. I know the regulars. Okay. Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts your moral. Now, honestly, I want to hear. Are you amazed at these verses in the Bible and the wisdom of the scriptures? Because this is the wisdom of our God. Honestly, are you blown away by these passages? Every time I read them, I'm blown away. Amazing, right? This is why I trust the Spirit to take over. I ask the Spirit, you take over. You guide. And have me speak what you want me to speak on. So I make it a policy. If someone has anger issues, someone is wrathful or someone is verbally abusive, I cut them off. I don't associate with them. Do you know why? Can I tell you why? Because it's going to cause me to sin. It's going to cause me to get angry. It's going to cause me to lose my testimony. It's going to cause me to swear. And we may come to blows. So to protect myself, I have to avoid them. It's not because I'm better than them. It's because I'm weak. You keep pressing me, I'm going to cuss you out. I'm going to insult you, and then we get violent, and then one of us goes to the hospital. Hopefully you, not me. <laughs> All right. Beautiful, right? Now let's pray the Lord's Prayer. Name of the Father, and of the Son, of the Holy Spirit. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, our only begotten Son. His only begotten Son, our Lord. Holy Spirit, 
control my tongue and mouth, destroy all mistakes and errors, save me from stammering in my list, and recall the facts perfectly for the glory of Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord. Glory to the Father, Son, and Spirit. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Give us the power to love you the way you deserve to be loved. <clears throat> Was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended to heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of body, and life everlasting. Amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, both now and forever, unto ages of ages. In the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name we pray. Holy Spirit, please take over. Glory to the Father and the Spirit. Amen. Now, guys, we're going to play some clips on James White. And then we're going to limit it. This is going to be a series. I said I'm going to start the series. But Lord willing, pray for me. I want to finish at least three articles with this upcoming week. Pray I get these articles done, timely fashion for your benefit. Pray the Lord will save me from errors to be factually sound, not too lengthy, but to the point and leave no stone unturned. Because I'm now writing, it's not so much writing an article, I'm now writing out verses from this translation. The New Testament for everyone, a fresh translation by N.T. Wright. Now, why? Again, I thank the Lord Jesus for putting me in ministry. And again, the Lord bless you and be your reward for financially supporting the ministry. Next week, I have to go meet my accountant to start sending payments to the IRS. Pray they will lessen it. I need your prayers. Love you, Lepanto. Romeo, I love you guys, man. You regulars, when I see you, you bring joy to my heart. I mean it. N.T. Wright is considered a world-renowned New Testament scholar. What's beautiful is in his translation, I haven't studied him well. I haven't followed him. He confirms that the word pistis Christu, pistis Jesu, means faithfulness of Christ. And he confirms the word for pistis means uh, faithfulness. And he's a Protestant. I know Pepperoni on Pizza is watching this. Protestant. So here's a Protestant that shows you what I've said. And I thank the Lord because I'm not a scholar. I'm not. I'm not being humble. I'm, being, I'm not a scholar. And I do get kind of, ugh, when someone says I'm a scholar, the young man we're about to show, he says he's a scholar. Well, he is credentialed. He's a professor. But when someone says they're a scholar, especially when they're young, I cringe. I'm not a scholar. I am not. Now, I'm not being humble. I'm not a scholar. I'm not a scholar of languages. I don't have super in-depth knowledge. This is facts. I know you th may think otherwise. No, I'm not. I'm not a scholar. And I'm not trying to be a scholar. That's not my calling. I do not care to be a scholar. What I want to is know the Bible, handle it correctly, live it out to prove that I love Jesus to myself, not to you. I want to show Jesus I love him. I want to finish the race. Loving Jesus, so when I see my Lord, he will have a smile. I don't care about someone saying, Sam is a scholar. I don't care about that. Honestly, I don't. And I don't want to. Because that's when you get puffed up and become arrogant, and you end up like James White. But it's always fresh, re refreshing when someone who's considered a scholar confirms what you're saying. So here, I'm quoting the verses relevant to justification, deity of Christ, and I want to Post it. And then I have another post on what it means to be in the form of God. So I need your prayers. And I need your prayers to be disciplined to get healthier and holier and for provision. Now, again, I want the Lord to be glorified. And I thank the Lord for you. You guys on PayPal Patreon, you are truly used of the Lord to keep me in ministry. Now, if the Lord doesn't want me in ministry, may he give me the grace at least to finish out my life, provide for my daughters. He doesn't need me to teach. If he wants me to disappear, 
as long as I live for Jesus and love Jesus. But I'll tell you something, why it's hard for me not to teach. Here, I'm going to show you something. And by the way, I'm no Jeremiah, so don't misunderstand what I'm saying. This is how I feel. This is what happens to me. All right. This is what happens to me. So we have uh, three hours of teaching time, and so we can. Jeremiah 27 tonight. Oh, Yahweh, you've enticed me, and I was enticed, meaning you persuaded me. I didn't want to teach. He didn't want to teach anymore. You were stronger than I, and you prevailed. I didn't want to teach. I got sick of people making fun of me and attacking me and ridiculing me and wanting to kill me. Because of you, I'm miserable and lonely. I'm all by myself. Because I have to tell people their sins and I can't be politically correct and they hate me. I've become a laughing stock all day long. Now watch here. Everyone mocks me. For each time I speak, I cry aloud. I call out violence and devastation. I tell them, God is about to punish you for your sins. You don't repent. Because for me, the word of Yahweh has resulted in reproach. Because of me preaching your word, people are deriding me, insulting me all day long. And I'm tired. See, these are the true men of God. If you read the Bible honestly, you're not going to find men who are sinless, perfect, effeminate, right? Queers. You're going to find real men, real women, with real struggles, with real complaints, who even succumb to sin. Judah, when slept with a whore, Genesis 38. Samson, Judges 16, verse 1, went found a whore at Gaza and slept with her. So the Christian life is not this rosy picture of people who are always sinless and they're always articulate, always kind. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Like. No, that's a lie, man. That's not the real Christian life. Go read your Bibles, dudes. You effeminate queers who think you know what it is to be a Christian. This is Christianity. Complaining, grumbling, arguing with God, being disgusted by being a prophet or an apostle, getting tired, wanting to just be at peace and don't, don't want the drama and and struggling with fleshly desires and sexual... That's all throughout the Bible, man. What Bible are you guys reading? Here, look what he says. I'm going to show you another thing that Jeremiah did. Because of me, the word of the Lord Yahweh is result in reproach. But if I say, here's... This is how honestly it's how I feel. May God destroy my pride and self-deceit. If I say I will not remember him or speak anymore in his name, you see how angry he is? You see how angry he is? He's saying, but if I say... Yanni, did, did I say I believe your mother's a whore of the Shia? Yes, I do. She's a whore of the Shia, Yanni. She's a whore. If I say I won't preach about Jesus anymore, I won't talk about Jesus anymore. Look what happens to me. Look, look. But if I say I will not remember him or speak anymore in his name, then in it my heart becomes like a burning fire. I swear to you, that's how I feel. I'm not lying to you. I can't not talk about Jesus. Shut up in my bones. And I am weary of holding it in and I cannot prevail. Every time I try to stop talking about the Lord, it's like a fire in my bosom. I got to let it out. You caught it? You paying attention? That's what Jeremiah is saying. See, you prevailed against my will. I didn't want to teach your word. I didn't want to preach your word. I didn't want to be a prophet anymore. I'm tired, Lord. I'm miserable. I'm sad. I'm lonely. They hate me because of your word. But I can't stop because you won't let me stop. You got a fire in my bosom that I got to let it out. Even though I don't want to teach your word. See that? I'm not lying to you. When there have been times where I didn't want to teach and walk away, I couldn't. I'm not lying to you. The Lord knows my heart better than me. Focus, everyone. No distractions. I need you to learn. Let the Spirit work through me. You see? He says, I can't. But I'm suffering because of your word, Lord. I can't. Now look at the point that Jeremiah got to. So thank you for the support. Without PayPal, Patreon, and it's not, I'm not, it's not tax deductible. I hope you don't mind because some people complain. Now, well, all right, go give to Mike Winger. What do you want me to do? This is the only way I can get income. May I use it lawfully? Now watch this. Look at the point that Jeremiah got. This is real Christianity. This is real Christianity. Not the fake, effeminate, 
Scholarly queer bait Christianity. Yes, this is a white Kona. Crystals, you'll do plenty without me. Thank you, sister. I thank the Lord Jesus for putting love in your heart for me, but I promise you, the Lord, if I didn't exist, would have someone else better than me. And I thank you, sister, because... <clears throat> thank you, sister. You moved me in my spirit. <clears throat> thank you. But watch here. Jeremiah 15, 15 to 21. Watch here. Look at this. Look at the point that Jeremiah got to. Look at this. You who know, O Yahweh, remember me. Take notice of me. Look what he says. Take vengeance for me on my persecutors. This is Jeremiah 15, 15 to 20. Look. Look at the point. He even insults God. He even insults God. But look how patient God is. See, God is patient. He doesn't rush to destroy you when you insult him. He understands. He's going to remind you gently. Enough. You don't know what you're saying. Enough. Come to your senses. And then he has to bring the smack down. Take vengeance for me on my persecutors. Do not, in view of your patience, take me away. Do not let me suffer the judgment that's falling on them. Know that for your sake I endure reproach. They're insulting me because they know I'm your prophet. I'm speaking your words. They hate me because they hate you. But I found your words. Your words are found aided up. You know what that means? It means... Let the Bible become part of your DNA. Let the Bible be engraved, written by the Spirit in your heart, your soul, your spirit, in your mind, on your tongue. Eat it up. Live it. Breathe it. So when I found your words, I ate them up. Now, this is the experience of all recent converts, right? This is the experience. Can you testify with Jeremiah that when you first came to the faith, you were on fire? full of joy and elated on cloud nine, floating. But then reality sinks in. It's like marriage. The honeymoon is over. Here. Your words became for me joy and gladness in my heart, for I have been called by your name. You called me to be yours by your authority, right? And they were a joy. Isn't that true? When the convert, the convert syndrome, isn't that true? When we first came, we we're on fire, full of joy, and we we're going to turn the world. Then the honeymoon phase is over, and then reality sinks in. Watch here. Look what he says here. Oh, Yahweh of God of hosts, I did not sit in the circle of merrymakers. Now watch. This is the Christian life. I do not party with those who party. I don't go to nightclubs. I don't go to bars and sit with people get drunk or get high and do drugs and want to entice people to have sex. I don't rejoice in these things. But now watch. But because of your hand, your power upon me, I sat alone. Because of you, I had to be alone. Because there were very few who thought like me, believed like me, and loved you the way I'm trying to love you. And then you filled me with indignation. I hated the things you hate. I hated this immoral lifestyle. But now watch here. He complains. Watch here. Okay, all of this that I've done, why has my pain been perpetual? This is the Christian life. Jesus has a good plan for your life. You won't get thick. You'll get rich. You'll be happy. No, that's not Christianity. That's a lie. This is Christianity. This is the Christian life. My pain, there's no end to it. My wound, incurable, refusing to be healed. So he's complaining to God. Why? Why? David Sherrill, the Lord bless you and preserve you and all of us. Why, God? Why am I miserable? Why am I lonely? Why aren't you healing me? Now look at him. Insult God. The last line. Will you indeed be to me like a deceptive stream with water that is unreliable? He just insulted God. You know, because I thought you're the fountain of living waters. I thought that anyone who comes to you will be refreshed, made whole, new, full of joy. But the more I come to you, the more miserable I am. So did you deceive me, God? Look what Yahweh says. Now he responds. Look at what God says. Therefore, thus says Yahweh. So he responds. If you return, then I will cause your turn. He's telling him, you need to repent. Even a prophet had reached the point that he had to repent because he had sinned against God. You saw that? 
So God is saying, Jeremiah, enough. I know your circumstances are overwhelming you and you're letting your emotions get the better of you. But I'm telling you, you need to repent. See it? If you return, then I will cause you to return. Then I will then reuse you again. See, I want to cry here because isn't this our life? Let's be honest with ourselves. God knows our hearts. We can't hide. Hasn't, haven't there been times where we were angry with God? Why, God? Why? <clears throat> Why, Lord? Why am I in this pain? Why am I lonely? Why do you seem so far from me? Why are you so distant? If I lose you, I have nothing. I've already lost everything. And if you abandon me, what hope is there for me? If I lose you, it's over. I've lost everything already, God. And if you ignore me, and if you do not respond to me, and you turn your face from me, it's over for me. Come on. You know you've been there. Even these prophets who heard God audibly and saw God visibly, they saw God visibly and heard God audibly. They also went through that. So now, what does God say? Before me, you will stand. See, again, if you repent, you'll stand and you'll be my prophet. Now, look what he's saying. If you extract the precious from the worthless, stop speaking stupid, foolish things. Only say that which is precious. You will become my mouthpiece. You see why I asked the Holy Spirit to enable us to be his mouthpiece? They, for their part, may turn to you. They're going to have to turn to you, but you're not going to turn to them. You're, gonna, you're not going to be like them. But as for you, you must not turn to them. Then I will make you to this people, a fortified wall of bronze. I'm going to make you unbreakable, immovable, unshakable, unbeatable, because my power is infinite. And they will fight against you, but they will not prevail against you. For I am with you to save you and deliver you, declares Yahweh. So I will deliver you from the hand of the evil ones. And I will redeem you from the grasp of the ruthless ones. Didn't I tell you your Bible is supernatural? Your Bible is beautiful? Your Bible is real. It, it is historically accurate. And it tells you how real these men and women are. It doesn't make them into these holier than thou and Jesus loved you. And that's not Christianity. Brethren, that's not Christianity. It's a lie. Let me read. What, guys, please bear with me because I feel led by the Spirit. We're going to get into it. I got a lot of time. Now watch Psalm 38. If you want to know about, if you want to understand the Christian life, Read the Psalms because there, there are Psalms about depression. There are Psalms about anger. There are Psalms about joy. There are Psalms about happiness. There are Psalms about loneliness. It's covered. Well, what does that tell you? If you have Psalms about depression and anger and loneliness and joy, that means this is a Christian life. There'll be times you'll be angry, lonely, sad, depressed, and joyful. This is Christianity. Don't let them give you this fake picture of Christianity. Now watch Psalm 38 here. This psalm is about depression. Watch. Did you know there is a psalm about depression? And who wrote it? David. Look. If you just had this psalm, you're going to say, man, David was miserable. Dude, this guy was suffering from depression. Watch. Watch here. Okay. Oh, Yahweh, reprove me not in your wrath. Say, I'm about to cry again. Please don't punish me in your anger. And discipline me not in your burning anger. For your arrows have pressed deep into me. See, God is like a warrior in battle. He shoots you down. Because at that time, those arrows and swords. So you've shot me with your arrows. You've treated me like an enemy. And you're striking me down like an enemy. And your ha hand has pressed down upon me. Hand means your power. Now watch. Look. There is no soundness in my flesh because of your indignation. See, when he says flesh, he's feeling sick. He's got a disease. There's no health in my bones because of my sin. See, one way God disciplines you, one way God punishes you, one way God <clears throat> will bring discipline is allow you to get sick. He allows you to get sick. And so uh, something about David, he's struggling with some health issue. My flesh, my bones 
for my iniquities go over my head. As a heavy burden, they weigh too much for me. I can't handle it. My wounds stink and rot because of my folly, because I'm stupid, I'm foolish, I'm sinful. I made a mistake. But this punishment, I can't handle it. It's too much. I'm in pain. I'm bent over and greatly bowed down. I go mourning all day long because of this disease. I'm not at peace. This illness, I can't function. I'm not at peace. I'm in agony. For my loins are filled with burning. There's no soundness in my flesh. I am faint, meaning I'm growing weak. I can't do it. I'm badly crushed. I groan because of the agitation of my heart. Lord, all my desires before you. And my sighing is not hidden from you. I know that you see my cries as I cry out to you for mercy. And I know you will hear me. My heart throbs. My strength forsakes me. And the light of my eyes, meaning I'm going dim. I'm slowly dying and withering. Even that has gone from me. My loved ones and my friends stand aloof from my plague. See, he was sick. He had a disease. Even my kinsmen stand far off. Doesn't that sound like COVID? What happened with COVID? What they did to people with COVID? Where you can even visit loved ones. They were incubated and you couldn't see them. And many people died. Right? Those who search for my life, nay, there's my enemies who hate me, who put snares for me, destroy me. Those who seek to do me evil have threatened destruction. And they meditate on deception all day long. They plot to kill me. Now watch here. But I, like a deaf man, do not hear. And I am like a mute man who does not open his mouth. In other words, he doesn't attack them. He doesn't defend himself because he has no strength. I, I, I am a light. And... I am like a man who does not hear and whose mouth are no reproofs because I wait on you, O Yahweh. I wait on you. I won't defend myself. I'll let you defend me because I know you won't abandon me. For I said, save lest they be glad over me. Save me from this so my enemies won't rejoice thinking that you struck me down. See, ah, look, look, he's wicked. Even God hates him. Look, look what God did to him. God struck him down with cancer. Look, God hates him. Don't let them rejoice over me. Who, when my foot stumbles, they magnify themselves against me. When they see me fall in sin, they rejoice. Ah, look, he fell in sin, that hypocrite. <laughs> That's what he's saying. For I'm ready to fall. I'm about to give up, God. I can't do this. See how genuine and real these words are? You see how genuine and real these words are? This is from the heart. From the heart. I can't do it anymore. I'm about to give up. For I confess my iniquity. I am full of anxiety because of my sin. But my enemies are vigorous and strong. They're too many for me. They want me to fall. They want me to be destroyed. They want to see me be ashamed because they hate me, my God. And those who wrongfully hated me, wrongfully hated me, abound. They're too many. I can't deal with them. And those who pay evil for good, they accuse me for I pursue what is good. And here is his last words. Do not forsake me, O Yahweh. Oh, my God, <clears throat> do not be far from me. Rush, make haste to help me, O Lord of my salvation. Does that sound like you? This is the Christian life. This is the Christian life. Now, how many of you were aware that this psalm was in your Bible? And now in the Greek, it's Psalm 37. How many of you were aware that this psalm was in your Bible? How many of you? Aren't you appreciative for this word of God? Aren't you appreciative that God gave you a book that's real? That's real and not lies? This is the Christian life. This was David. You understand the men and women of God have gone through what you've gone through, but they survived. So God is showing you this to say, look, don't despair of life. 
People have gone through what you've gone through and worse, and I preserve them. Look to their examples to know I will preserve you. Trust in me. But you see what David was saying? God, if you turn your back on me because of my sins, I have no hope. It's over for me. It's beautiful, right? The Bible's beautiful. Anyway, now we're going to go into Calvinism. So I just wanted to share that with you because I want you to know these classes are not just apologetics. It's not just to refute and defend. I'm hoping the Spirit will work through me to help me and all of you, all of us. We're all learning. I'm still learning. I don't know everything. To see how deep the Bible is, how marvelous the Bible is, how supernatural the Bible is, how real the Bible is, and it has the answers for everything. And that we need to now meditate, practice the wisdom of God so that we can finish the race. See that? So I want you to focus now. But you see, so God spoke to you, right? Now, crystals, I didn't plan this. Now, guys, just let you know, these things I don't plan. It just comes to me because I'm trusting the spirit to work through me. Are you now thankful, crystals, that God speaking to you, right? See, see how real our God is? Wow. Brother Sam, it's actually like the Holy Spirit speaking to you. I just came out praying, crying to God about the surgery. And this one needs to survive, but I don't want to get it. Thanks. Yeah, God is talking to you. Believe me, brethren, I may not tell you about my own aches. I feel bloated, uncomfortable, my lower back. That's why I say, Lord, if I have found favor, grant me this one wish. Just let me see my daughters grow up. And even if you don't, I trust in you. And let me die in their arms. Do not let me get to the point where I'm a burden. No chemotherapy, no radiation, no insulin. When it's my time, let me die quickly because I don't want to be a burden on anyone. I don't want to be old in a wheelchair and people have to care for me. If I have found favor in your sight, my God. <clears throat> let me see my daughters grow up and I die quickly and be a burden to no one. And let me finish the race to glorify you. <clears throat> Man, I'll be a burden, Lord. Please don't let me be a burden on anyone. <clears throat> All right. So we're going to go into now the topic, right? Now, I'm going to show you something. We're going to go into Calvinism. You ready? Lord, increase the numbers for your glory. Glory to the Father and the Spirit. I wish I did, Elias. I wish I did. <clears throat> I wish I had a heart of gold. I don't. I, my sins are too great. They are. And I try to be genuine so I don't be fake like some of these fake bastards who think they're Christians and pretend they're Christians. All right? All right. Let's go into it. And I'm going to show you where to find this material because I'm going to play some clips and we're going to go to John Calvin refuting Anthony Rogers. May I be a burn on no one, my God. <clears throat> you are our God. You are my God. You who are the Father. You who are the Son, Lord Jesus. You are the Holy Spirit, three in one. You are our God. <clears throat> Have mercy on me. Have mercy on us. Woo. Sorry, guys. I just, sometimes it happens. Anyway, is your Bible, you know our God is beautiful when he can make grown men cry. The Lord is so beautiful, he makes grown men cry. Uh, Unica, it's not me. My sins are great. I would cause you to stumble. It's the Holy Spirit working through me. I wish, yes, Arian. But remember, do me a favor, brother. Ask God. He will not allow me to get puffed up because it's not about being the greatest. It's not. But I'll tell you what the Lord does. Can I show you something, what the Lord does for me? Because many have turned against me because I'm not politically correct. And because of Anthony Rogers... Me and David don't work together. And I love David. David is a great man. I'll never turn it. As long as David doesn't attack Catholic Church, Orthodox Church, and he doesn't. He doesn't. As long as he is open and he loves all the churches, David's got my back. I will support him and fight for him. I love that man. But, again, because of Anthony Rogers, this filthy cow bastard, you know, 
we don't work together because David and him are still in good terms. That's okay. But I'll tell you how God, yeah, David would. I'll tell you how God saves me from them coming back to slander me. You want to see how, I want you to see the goodness of our Lord, the beauty of our Lord, how he protects me. You want to see this? Now, because I can screen share, I'm going to show you something. Watch here. This is when, this was a couple of years ago. I was actually heavier here, contrary to some people. And I've lost weight and I hope I keep it off. You know, I'm paranoid about that. But anyway, I was at a reformed Calvinist church. I wasn't a Calvinist, but I was there and I was speaking about Joe's witnesses. Now, this video has gone viral. So if you want to find it, you go to my channel. Okay, you go to my channel, you search engine, you put in Jehovah's Witnesses. You're going to see the video. I'm going to play it from him. He said it. And he said it on more than one occasion. This video right here. It's already 482,000 views. Right. Okay, watch here. This is him. God did this so that they can't come back. I'm not saying David would. He would. I'm not saying he would do that. But in case they try to lie about me, it's now recorded for perpetuity. Now watch. Oh, do I love pepperoni pizza. Okay, watch here. God did this. This is a Calvinist church. Look. Right. Same thing with this guy. So if you listen to this guy, you are going to find out. We have with us, if you can get past all the issues, we have one of the greatest Bible teachers in the world. Wow. We have the greatest apologist against Islam, not in the world, in history. You see that? Who do you think had him say that and record it for perpetuity? Who do you think? The Lord, just in case they want to slander me and say that I am a fake, I don't know the Bible, I'm overrated. Okay? You see what the Lord, you see the love of the Lord? May he continue to enable us to love him. Watch. And why do you think Anthony Rogers is upset and livid? Because he's never said this about Anthony Rogers. Never. Why do you think Rogers is upset and attacked Catholic Church? Because he sees the damage I'm doing against Calvinism and how the Lord is using me to cause people to fall in love with the Orthodox and Catholic Church. May I be used by the Spirit to help people see how beautiful and glorious the ancient churches are. Right? Look what he's going to say. Look. And if you know me, you know I do not toss around comments like that. Right? I'm dead serious here. You go to all of history, this is the guy. All right. So with that said, he's going to be talking about not Islam, Jehovah's Witnesses. But he's just as epic at that. All right. Wow. Okay, watch here. One more time. Right. Same thing with this guy. So if you listen to this guy, you are going to find out. We have with us, if you can get past all the issues, we have one of the greatest Bible teachers in the world. Right. We have the greatest apologist against Islam, not in the world, in history. And if you know me, you know I do not toss around comments like that. Right? I'm dead serious here. You go to all of history, this is the guy. All right. So with that said, he's going to be talking about not Islam, Jehovah's Witnesses. But he's just as epic at that. All right. There you go. Yeah. Wow. You see how the Lord is protecting me? He's having it from the mouth of David Wood. Never said that about Anthony. He won't. The greatest apology against Islam in history. No, that's not true. Believe me, I don't believe that. One of the greatest Bible teachers? No, that's not true either. No, I'm not... Being humble. It's not true, brethren. I'm not. It's just God's anointing and favor on me. May the Holy Spirit be glorified in my life. May the Holy Spirit own me. But this is how the Lord protects me. So if they want to say something bad about me, say, hey, fat cow Dodgers, the dude that whose coattail you ride, whose butt you kiss so he can give you platform and get you subscribers, never said it about you, you fat cow. Never said it about you. He never said about you, you Calvinist piece of garbage. Never. Never said it about you. <laughs> was it work? Come on, man. What happened here, dude? It was working. Hold on. Darn. <laughs> and you know what, Antonia Dodgers? You can always blame it on the decree of your Muslim God. It was decreed before creation that David Wood would say, I'm one of the greatest Bible teachers and the greatest apology against Islam in history. 
So you can take it up with your Muslim God because you don't worship the God of Scripture. You're a deceiver. And you can blame him because this was the creed. <laughs> no matter what you do, I'm going crazy. I'd rather be alone. All right. Now, let's go back here. This is what you're going to do. You're going to go to my community section. Let me enlarge it. And may I be the servant of the ancient churches. May I serve the Orthodox, the Catholic, till I die. And I want you to know I love you guys. I love you guys. And I want to serve you till I die. And may I never betray you. And Protestant Evangelical Church, I love you guys. But I do want you to come to the fullness of the truth. You're not there. But the Lord still have mercy on you. And I pray we'll all be together in heaven. Now, you go to community section. Now we're going to go into some meat. Can I do that? High pitch sound again. No matter what you do, I man, I should, I should have been an actor, dude. Why am I here? Why couldn't I be in Hollywood? Oh, by the way, interestingly, because of you guys, God bless you guys. You guys are taking my clips. You guys are taking my clips and making me go viral on TikTok, Twitter, Instagram. Mm -hmm. Let me share two two stories. I went into a supermarket several days ago. The security guard said, "Hey, man." You're Sam Shamoon. I go, yeah, how did you know? I see you on TikTok. I was walking three days ago to get my cardio in. A guy outside, it was night. It was night. And I was wearing a black hoodie to go get my five, six mile walk in. Because I got to do it to stay lean. As I'm walking, a guy, it's at night, guys. The guy with a dog, he goes, hey, dude, wait, wait, wait. I know you. I know you. you, you you're that Christian apologist, man, on TikTok. I go, yeah, yeah. I go, we're neighbors, dude. So you guys have made me famous, more famous than Brad Pitt. I swear. There's not a time if I'm out that someone doesn't. Run. Thank you, guys. God bless you. May we give Jesus all the glory, all the fame. Not me, but you guys made me a celebrity. I uh, TikTok, Twitter, Insta, they're recognizing me. That means the Muslims recognize me. So thank you, guys. That means I can't go to Dearborn because the moment I step in, everyone's going to recognize me. And it's going to be jihad, fi sabil Allah. Thank you guys for making it hard for me because now I can't go to certain pockets of the world. Thank you. Good job. Now, because of you, I can't visit Dearborn. All right? Because of you, I can't go to certain places in New York which taken over by the Muslims. Thank you guys for making it hard for me. I can't even travel certain parts of the world. You think I can go to Turkey to get hair transplant? Because over there, it's dirt cheap. You think I can go to Turkey and get liposuction? Because there it's dirt cheap. No, I have to stay in America and spend an arm and leg for liposuction and hair transplant because of you guys making me famous. Damn, man. Damn. Everything is cheap in Turkey. You can get a hair transplant for dirt cheap. You can get liposuction dirt cheap. But no, you think if I go to Turkey, I'll ever come out alive? No, I have to stay in America and pay $10,000. Can't do it. I got to pay the IRS. Thank you. Anyway, when you go here on the community section, you're going to click here. Let me enlarge it. I want to play some clips. Check every day the community section because I try to upload daily. These two videos you have to watch. This one and this one. Oh, boy. This young man here, he's a biblical linguist, a scholar, a professor. He utterly exposes James White as a fraud. You want proof he doesn't know Greek? He's a fraud. We're going to play certain clips. But do check it out because I'm also posting older rebuttals to leading monotheists, monotheists like Shibra Ali. And here is the black stone. Everyone recognize what this looks like. So go to my community section. Take advantage. Take the materials, upload them, translate them, use them, study them, share them accurately. People wonder, why the hell does this look like a woman's body part? Well, that's exactly why. Because if you study pre-Islamic Arabian paganism, pre-Islamic Arabian pagan, paganism, they were fertility cults. They worshipped the stars, the sun and moon, and they worshipped the gods and goddesses of fertility. And so a lot of them, were involved in gross 
sexually immoral practices in imitation of the gods and goddesses because their view, their gods and goddesses had body parts and they would engage in sexual immoral acts. In fact, the Canaanite god Il was known to have a huge male member, a huge male genital. That's how they spoke of their gods and goddesses. So their gods and goddesses were humans, but on a higher level, who had the strength to perform amazing sexual acts. This is why you find what's called phallic symbols. Are you aware the obelisk is an actually an Egyptian phallic symbol? The masons, when they put obelisk, here, you can look it up. That's that's actually designed after the male genital, the male penis. That's what it is. That's what an obelisk is because they are into fertility cults and they also worship the male private part and the female private parts because those are the instruments used to procreate life. Do you know that? So it is not a coincidence that this is shaped like a woman's private part. If you do any research in the background of Islam, the pagans were into phallic symbols. Symbols that represented the male organ or the female private parts. Not lying. Again, Sheikh Google, the greatest scholar ever lived. Go there, type in phallic symbols, type in obelisk. The, because the Masons are heavy into Egyptology. The obelisk, you see it everywhere. This is a phallic symbol. It's supposed to represent the male organ. Did you guys know that? Did you guys know that? So although, like the Washington Monument, when you see the obelisk, you're seeing a male. Anyhow, I'm trying to be G-rated. Male penis. Yeah, it's in cemeteries. And this is supposed to be shaped after, guess what? Guess what? You guys got it, right? Yeah, this is how perverted this religion is. And can you believe it? There are Muslims who go touch it and kiss it because Muhammad would kiss the black stone, touch the black stone, and weep on it. So these pagans don't realize they're touching something that represents a female body part. You caught it? Right there. But they don't know because they've been deceived by Satan working through Muhammad. You get it? Yeah, yeah. Anyway, now let's go here. Go to the community section. You have to watch this interview. You have to watch this interview with this young scholar because James White went livid. James White even admits that he had to shut down their critique of his Greek because he was angry that a biblical linguist, a scholar, would say that James White's Greek, in very nice words, is bad. James White is a fraud. He exposes him. But this is a video that Leighton did was a response to the original one. And I'm going to play clips from the original one. This is the original video that made James White lose it. James White is self-destructing because he sees everyone is calling him out. No one's impressed by the bully, and they're exposing him as a fraud. So you go here. I'm going to play clips. Are you ready? He, this guy is a scholar. He teaches at Northwest Seminary. He studied under some of the greatest scholars of the Greek New Testament, one of whom is a Reformed Calvinist himself, Dea Carson. Now, the beautiful thing about this young man, if you go to the interview he did with Leighton, one hour, 44 minute mark, he used to be a Calvinist for 10 years. And he left Calvinism to the chagrin of James White. Now, let me shock you about his story. Now, he says what made him a Calvinist was someone told him to read Romans 9. He read Romans 9. And he said, okay, Calvinism is true. Fast forward 10 years later. He starts reading Romans 9 in Greek because as a linguist, he has to read Greek to sharpen his Greek reading skills. So he doesn't read in translation. He's got to read Greek because he's got to keep conversing with Greek. He goes, when he read Romans 9 in Greek, he was shocked. He went back and read it. 
again, then reread it and re-reread it. Then he did what I did. Glory to God how the Spirit guides us. If we're tuned with the same Spirit, we'll be guided to the same truth. He then decided what I decided to do. True story, guys. I went back and looked at all the verses that Paul quoted in Romans 9 to see their context. When I saw what their context was, that's when I saw how Calvinists butcher Romans 9 and the Calvinistic interpretation of Romans 9 is a satanic perversion of Romans 9. In his testimony, he says, that's what he did. He went back to look at all the citations. Paul quoted, and then he realized, man, I was wrong. No one told him. He just said, wow, now that I've looked at the context of the passages Paul was citing, Paul wasn't teaching Calvinistic predeterminism. He was teaching someone else. Go watch my series on Romans 9. So now we're going to see how they utterly embarrass James White. And boy, did White go into the ad hominems. Oh, this guy, uh, he never adjusted. Couldn't help him humiliate himself. So go there and watch it, but we're going to go here. So we're going to go to the video. I got a few stamps, and then we're going to, like I said, today is destroying Calvin Day by the power of the triune God. The he confirms what I said, brethren. What did I say? I said in my discussion on saving faith with JD and others, I said, your constant appeal to the tenses of verbs is an indication you really don't know Greek. I said it in a nice way. Go back and you'll see. What do I mean? When someone has to tell you and impress you with Greek constantly. Now, don't get me wrong. There are times in which you have to go to the Greek. I'm not lying or not denying that. But when someone tells you, well, this is an heiress and a perfect and an imperfect, he's trying to bully you and intimidate you. And it doesn't work with me. I even got JD to admit, yeah, yeah, just because an heiress doesn't necessarily mean that. I go, then why don't you stop appealing to the Greek that you don't know? I said it. He's going to say the same thing. Because remember, when the New Testament in Greek, Greek was the living language. I'm not talking about modern Greek. We know that's what I'm talking about Koine Greek. When they spoke, they were speaking a living language, communicating in real time. Did you Do you actually think, think about how stupid this is. You actually think that when John is writing or Paul is writing, say, hey, wait, hmm, let me use the perfect tense. Because later on, they're going to come and parse the tenses of verbs, whether it's perfect, imperfect, aorist, is the present, indicative, present, because they're going to parse the verbs I'm using. So let me use aorist here. Let me use the imperfect here. You actually think that's what they're doing? They were simply speaking and writing in a language to communicate truths and like any one of us, they would use verbs synonymously. I said that a while back, and here's the linguist who confirms it. This is why when someone tries to bully you with the Greek, don't be intimidated. Say, dude, try not to impress me with the Greek you don't know. That's why I got rid of Paul Ross. The moment I see someone telling me Greek, I know he's trying to impress me or bully me, and I hate bullies. It's not going to work with me. Now, let's hear it from the horse's mouth, shall we? James White is livid. The world is turning against him. Sucks being you, Jimmy. Jimmy! Jimmy! We'll start at the last clip. I got three clips to play. Let's start here. Okay, watch here. Watch here. Hearing, uh, the one hearing and lear learning, he didn't seem to understand those are participles. They're not finite verbs. Um, and so he was in error about his application at that point. Watch. Okay, that's it. Uh, I... I face palmed within myself when yeah. I heard that. Um, now, people who don't know Greek, uh, it's fine. But I would just like to say, oh man, that was actually kind of, I don't want to be mean, but... Uh, no, be mean. That statement makes no sense. Oh! Like, it, it is evident that white doesn't seem to quite understand Ouch. how meaning is conveyed. Um, and how the ways in which meaning is conveyed in language and in Greek. And uh, like, there, I said this in the beginning, there is nothing, I can think of next to no situation where if something is a participle, um, that would create a significant exegetical error as 
compared to if something is a finite verb. Um, for example, even with the very, the very thing we're talking about, you could use participles. You could say, everyone listening from the father and learning. Participles just an ing in English. ing, a uh, verbal adjective, really. It, it has different functions. You could also say, everyone who listens from the, uh, everyone, yeah, who listens from the father and learns. Everyone learns from the father and listens. Everyone listening from the father and learning. Like, there's, there's no difference in meaning um, whether if you use a participle or a, fin a finite verb, uh, again, to, to make it clear, hopefully to people, he ate finite verb eating participle. I don't know what exegetical error white thinks Leighton, um, is basing his interpretation on based on assuming a finite over a participle, but I don't think it exists. That's just, I can't even imagine a situation where uh, it would crumble and fall, interpretation would crumble and fall based on that. So to make that statement, I, it, it, it's, it's inconceivable. It doesn't make sense. Um, I don't know what he would think could possibly be conveyed that would Leighton's argument would fall apart based on the difference between a finite verb and a participle. But to state that at the end, as though it's some sort of gotcha that you don't know Greek and I, and, and here's why my, the, the grammar really shows your interpretation is wrong. Makes no sense in any way, shape or form. Sorry guys, let me do some because for some reason, sorry, for some reason I was trying to, Stop it, but it wasn't allowing me to do that for some stinking reason. Hold on. Hold on. We're going to play it again. See how I embarrassed them? Let me see if I can do it now. See, it won't let me do it. Hold on, guys. Uh, hold on. Because for some reason, I can't make this. Yeah, so I got to do something. Hold on, guys. We'll do this again. Do you hear how I embarrassed them? Oh, it's going to get worse. All right, hold on. Man, dude. Damn. Won't let me do it. All right, we're going to have to stay this way. All right. Now I can screen share. Sorry, but you heard it, right? How he schooled them? He embarrassed him. See? You see that? He embarrassed him. You caught it, right? We're going to play it one more time. I got a few clips. But it was giving me a hard time because I couldn't stop. Okay, now. All right, now I can do it. Darn. Okay, let's try it again. We're going to go back a little earlier. 149 mark. Watch here. He's a fraud. Listen. To say, oh, man, that was actually kind of, I don't want to be mean, but, uh, that statement makes no sense. Ouch. Like it, it is evident that white doesn't seem to quite understand how meaning is conveyed. Ouch. Um, and how the ways in which meaning is. You understand? I've told you for a while. Now you have a linguist. He's actually teaches. He's a professor at Northwest Seminary. He's bonafide. James White is a joke. You understand the judgment that's going to fall on James White because he's deceived people for many years into thinking he's a scholar of Greek and a scholar of church history. You know how many people he is deceived and misled because of his so-called arguments from Greek syntax, which he doesn't know? You caught it? The man has blood on his hands. That's why God is now exposing him. It's done. It's over for him. I'm letting you know it's done. The world is turning against Calvinists, non-Calvinists, scholars. This guy's a scholar. You know that no scholar takes James White seriously? There is no Greek scholar. Bill Mounts, who actually is a scholar of Greek New Testament, who's written books on Greek grammar used in seminary. I met him. He laughs at James White's exegesis, John 3, 16. He thinks it's a joke. I'm letting you know, scholars don't respect this guy. Calvinists are starting to turn against him. When you've gotten to that point, you're so disgusting and dishonest. Why are you doing ministry? Why are you doing ministry? Can you can you answer that question? Of what use are you? Your lies have been documented. Your errors have been exposed. People don't respect you. They don't trust your scholarship. They think you're a bully and narcissist. Of what use are you? So why, why are you doing this? May God save us from our pride and arrogance, destroy the memes in my eyes. May I not get to that point? Please, Lord, in your mercy. 
Why is he still doing it? What is he gaining? Is it really for Christ? Step away. Are you really doing it for the glory of Christ? No one likes you. You are a disgrace. You've lied about languages and church history. You've been caught. Protestants are turning against you. Scholars don't care for you. They don't think you're a scholar. Calvinists can't stand you. And he's trying to be nice. He goes, I want to be nice. Okay, let's finish it. Is conveyed in language and in Greek. And uh, like, there, I said this in the beginning. There is nothing. I can think of next to no situation See? where if something is a participle, um, that would create a significant exegetical error as compared to if something is a finite verb. Um, but for example, even with the very, the very thing we're talking about, you could use participles. You could say, everyone listening from the Father and learning. Participles just an ing in English. That's a participle. Ing. ing. Uh, verbal ing. adjective. Ing. Really. Eating. Hitting. Different ing. functions. You could also say, everyone who listens from the, uh, everyone, yeah, who listens from the Father and learns. Everyone learns from the Father and listens. Everyone listening from the Father and learning. Like, there's there's no difference in meaning Oh. Um, whether if you use a participle or a, fin a finite verb, uh, again, to, to make it clear, hopefully, to people, he ate, finite verb, eating, participle. I don't know what exegetical error Ouch. White thinks Leighton um, is basing his interpretation on based on assuming a finite over a participle, but I don't think it exists. That's just, I can't even imagine a situation where uh, it would crumble and fall, interpretation would crumble and fall based on that. So to make that statement, I, it, it, it's, it's inconceivable. It doesn't make it's sense. Laughing. Um, see, he's trying to be nice because remember in the scholarly field, you have to be nice when you refute someone. If you come off as too harsh, and condemnatory, you won't last in academia. This is why the Lord raised me up. Because yeah. I don't care about being an academic. I don't care about being a professor. And obviously no apologetics organization will ever take me on board. That's why I praise the Lord Jesus. And I thank you. And Lord bless you for supporting me on PayPal Patreon. Because if I had to go work to get a paycheck, I'd have to shut my mouth. My mouth is too fat. It's fatter than my love handles. I can't shut up. That means I'd be homeless. So he has to be nice. I don't have to be. No, me, no, no. Don't like this, man. No, man. No, man. No good, no good, man. I don't have to be nice. <laughs> okay, let's finish. So he has to be nice. I don't know what he would think could possibly be conveyed that would Leighton's argument would fall apart based on the difference between a finite verb and a participle. But to state that at the end as though it's some sort of gotcha that you don't know Greek. See? And I and, and here's why my the, the grammar really shows your interpretation is wrong. Makes no sense. Ouch! You see, he's showing that simply James White is bullying you trying to intimidate you because he's a narcissistic bully, but now he's being humiliated. The Lord's going to shame you. James White, you're done, dude. You're a joke. It's only your cult followers that are going to support you. In any way, shape, or form. Um, from someone who read, knows Greek or even just understands the basics of language. Did you hear it? Uh, and how, how, how you can communicate. Wait, when that part we got to hear. In, what what did you say, bro? In any way, shape, or form. Um, from someone who read knows greek or even just understands the basics of language so so if you really understood the greek language james you wouldn't say this because that shows you're stupid you don't know uh and how 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 you can communicate various things in, in various ways and mean the same thing hmm. so i don't know what he was getting at there i'm not going to try and suppose but it was pretty telling towards either a misunderstanding of how greek functions or language functions misunderstanding he's being nice no you don't know greek give me be patient. We have two more clips after this. Then we go into John Calvin, Anthony Roger. It'll be a series. Or just like a, trying to be a gotcha. Uh, 
in a in a really incomprehensible way. Incomprehensible way. Damn. Incompreh How does it feel that a young child, young enough to be James White's son, who's actually a bona fide scholar with a bona fide degree teaching in Northwest Seminary? He's actually a professor. James White is not. And I don't know if you know it, but his PhD or his whatever he got was from a diploma mill. It wasn't a bona fide. That's why scholars don't consider him a genuine scholar. They don't call him doctor. They go, his doctorate is fake. It's true because he got it from a diploma mill. And a leading Christian Egyptologist did a video saying, you're not a bona fide scholar, dude. You went and got your degree from a diploma mill. And he did, by the way. Some institution, I think it's now defunct. Someone young enough to be your child calling you out. See why I say he's a bully? Okay, but watch. Now let him finish. So just, so just for some clarity. So you're saying yeah. that uh, James White was possibly like, hey, Leighton was wrong with, about this. He doesn't necessarily mean anything, but he was wrong about that, right? I think that seems to be what's happening. Unless if he actually thought that there was a difference. Uh, well, I think the White says because it's a participle, mm. therefore Leighton's wrong because he thought it was a finite verb. Mm. That's the argument. Oh, yeah. I don't know what he's trying to imply by that. Exactly. Like to go further. Um, but that 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 statement in and of itself is nonsensical because which wouldn't have an argument stand or fall in this context based on those categories. Oof! Ah! <coughs> ah! Ah! Nonsensical. Oh! You're done, brother. Brother. You're done, man. <laughs> You're done, brother. Yeah, brother. <laughs> me, 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 me. Oh, I got hiccups. It's going to get better. Okay. Second clip. I'm going backwards, guys. So I hope you don't mind. Second clip. Oh, boy. I got hiccups. I shouldn't have done that. 57 minute mark. Watch the videos, guys. It's not like you can go there so, and make it go viral and share it. It's over for James White, dude. If he would really love the Lord, he'd just say, Man, I'm I'm done. No one respects me because you deserve it, you bully, how you treated people. Now watch here. We'll start. Let's see. Okay, let's start here. Oh man, come on, man. These commercials are killing me. Oh, what not you settle? All right, we got it, dude. We got it. These commercials, man. That's why monetize sucks. Okay. Listen to this. Purpose, at least. In that. So this is really interesting. Um, I'll briefly just comment again on the Greek thing. So he uses terms from Greek grammar. He says a genitive ablative, um, which would just be the idea. So a genitive is like. I notice again, he's throwing fancy terms. In. Genitive ablative. Okay. And because he wants to bully you. Look, I'm a scholar. You're not. Of. So like the love of God. The car of Steve, like Steve's car. The yeah, um, he's explaining discipling that. of Tim. Like, is that Tim doing disciple discipling people? Is that the type of discipling that Tim did? Like, it's like this of statement, and so it's very hard in Greek to know exactly what is the this of that. Like, what is the relationship being described? And ablative is just one way of describing that, which would be something like by means of something that is happening to. So, taught of God would be taught by means of God. That is all that conveys. Oof. It does not say anything Ouch. about the volition of the people being taught. You can't just say a Greek phrase, a, a Greek uh, grammatical category, or a semantic category, and then say, oh, and that means, therefore, that they're passive Ooh. in this learning. Th that is a genitive ablative. Like, it just has nothing to do with anything. Wow! So you wait, 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 friend. Hold on, hold on. You're saying, you're saying that James White is a fraud. You're saying James White is a liar and a bully who uses technical terms, genitive ablative to prove nothing. So a uh, saying it's a genitive ablative means nothing. It doesn't prove your point in the debate. No way. No way. Um, that, 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 that you're not going to get that, um, the volition or lack thereof from the grammatical 
or enzymatic category that's going on here. Wow. So again, just throwing terms out doesn't help. And Oof. that's not going to help. Um, so it's a bit strange. It's a bit strange. <laughs> now the final clip. Now this is a little longer one. It's about like 10 minutes long. We're going to go to the seven minute, 38 seconds. Are you enjoying him getting, getting James White exposed? And he's not Catholic. He's Protestant. Teaches Northwest Seminary. You should go see the tweets that James White made about this guy. And in his divine line, which he addresses with Leighton Flowers, he goes, oh, I just shut it down. I didn't hear it. Yeah, because you're a coward, dude. You really are. Now, here, this one is the last one. And then we go into, I hope you enjoy it. Lord, bless our numbers for your glory. And let me be content. Seven minute, 38 second mark. Seven minute, 38 second mark. Now, if James White repents, well, then we will show him love. But see, he's treated people like garbage for too many years. I know, because I knew him. And he wonders why people are turning against him here. It's seven minute, 38 second mark. Let's start a little earlier. Shut up with these commercials, man. Damn. Okay. So, uh, specific uh, clips. Let's dive into it. Sure, yeah. All Watch. Right. So let me know if you can hear. Of course, everyone in the comments, let they me know if Listen. we need to turn our mics up or something like that. You got to discuss them, the topic. What you say? I was going to say, I was going to joke. You got three, four million watching right now? Oh, yes, yes. Three and a half, <laughs> three and a half people. Uh, so actually, so the uh, first thing we're talking about here is uh, why it makes a really interesting point. I wanted to get your thoughts on. Of the debate does John 644 teach unconditional election? Obviously, is simply stating has the historical understanding of John chapter 6 since the Reformation. Is that a proper reading of the text? And I submit to you right now the only way to judge this debate is to judge on the basis of whether there is consistency in handling the word of God. All right. So, what stood out to you there? Yeah, I mean, watch what he's going to do. It's a watch. Look at this ponage. Look at this ponage, guys. You're going to rejoice. Then, remember, if he repents, we will show mercy. But until he repents, he gets what he deserves. Let us practice what he preach. Remember, if he repents, then we show mercy, right? May the Lord give us power to practice what we preach. Because you should see how he treat this young man and his treat him like he's a clown. No respect. It's really strange, I, I find, um, because, I mean, there's two things. He's talking about consistency in hermeneutics and or in his interpretation, which I think everyone's going to say, yeah. But then he says the historical interpretation since the Reformation, which is, that's just very strange to me. Um, Why? Because strange. the Reformation is very recent in Christian history. And Ooh. my basically, when I heard that, I went, so what? <laughs> you caught what he said? He goes, we need to focus on the Bible and what it says. And this has been the interpretation since the Reformation. Who cares? Reformation started in the 16th century, dude. What about the first 1,500 years? <laughs> and he's Protestant. <laughs> now watch here. Watch what he's going to do. Who, who, why does anyone care exactly. since the Reformation? I understand Protestantism. I understand there's a tradition. But he's, he's the one saying he doesn't want to be relying on tradition and wants to be just exegeting the text, right? But yet he's saying that somehow the Reformation is some sort of um, buttress of authority uh, in interpretation, or somehow more right than Oof. those who might have come earlier. So, uh, yeah, that was that was. Really Oof. Oof! Hold on, I gotta do this. This is James White. Antonia, you fat cow. This is what God's doing to you guys. Oof, that was rough, man. Damn, that was rough. Oof, I felt it, man. I felt it. Watch here. Really strange to me. Um, it does kind of show how indebted he is to a particular theological tradition. Um, I think his cards are pretty well shown there. Um, and I think that will become also a bit 
uh, more apparent as we move along. But yeah, I found that to be a very strange way to open a debate about what's supposed to be just <laughs> yeah. what the text means from 2000 years ago, because you skipped right. um, 1500 years. Right. No, it's like, uh, uh, yeah, uh, we've been reading it this way for 100 years. Like, that's the equivalent. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Agreed. Yeah, exactly. Oh, right on. <laughs> All righty. Uh, so. And Mumber, these guys, he's a Protestant. There. Spot 10 minutes. And of course, yes. they go through our, their presentations here. This is part of it. They are the people who present tense participles are looking upon the Son and believing in Him and receiving eternal life. Well, the Jews grumble about this. Uh, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph? And Jesus answers yeah, in verse 43. Yeah. All right. Yeah, um, I noted this to you when we were talking before. Uh, so we'll, I'm going to mention this now, and then I'll mention it again later on when okay. it becomes apparent again, which is uh, James brings Greek into Listen. this debate a lot. Watch. Uh, I don't doubt that James can read the New Testament to some degree in Greek. To some degree. Did you see the humiliation? I have no doubt he can read the Greek. To some degree, nice way of saying, he's no scholar. He doesn't know Greek. Did you hear it? Um, I want to be really kind when I say this, See? but it is quite apparent that James appears to have a rather superficial knowledge of Ooh. how language works. Oh, I didn't hear that. I didn't hear that. I did not hear that. What? A linguist, a scholar of Greek? Superficial knowledge of your highness, James White? Knowledge of Greek? No, I didn't hear that. I didn't hear that. I didn't hear that. I didn't hear I didn't hear that. or as particularly how Greek works. Because okay. he mentions things and he'll say things. And here he talks about the present tense participles uh, of looking on the sun and believing in him. And so he's he's noting the grammatical forms. Uh, he doesn't really give you uh, what he's trying to mean by that. He's saying things about grammar. Um, and I, and he's, not, he's never quite uh, clear exactly his exegetical point he's making. And he's going to do this again at the end. But he he's reading a lot into what into the into just basic forms of greek um a participle doesn't really mean much in and of itself and you can say things in multiple ways in greek and mean the exact same thing so unless you're going to explain what you mean by why a present tense participle is important here uh i don't know who you're signaling you're speaking to um are you just trying to signal that somehow you have this you you know the greek and there's some hidden meaning in the greek or something like that um yeah and so i'm gonna stop on this one because he actually brings this up again right near the end and it's it's pretty problematic uh because he he critiques leighton saying that leighton's exegesis is faulty because he didn't realize there were present tense participles and not finite verbs and anyone who knows greek and can read it and so you didn't really introduce me that much but i read greek so i'm a septuagint scholar Kind of by trade, um, and among other things that I work in, um, and so I read a lot of Greek. All the I'm a Septuagint scholar. He's a scholar of the Greek version of the Old Testament, the official Old Testament of the Orthodox Church, and he teaches. He's actually a professor at Northwest Seminary. Did you hear that? Time, and so if someone said that, I'm kind of getting ahead of the game here, uh, so we maybe can cover it a little less later. Uh, if someone says there's the, a huge exegetical weight that's between a participle like I'm walking and a finite verb, he walks, um, that that almost never would happen in language, and especially in Greek, that there'd somehow an argument fall apart 
based on that. Wow. And so James doesn't explain it later on, nor here, what he means by citing Greek grammar and citing oh. the forms of these things. Oh. But if you know Greek, you're going to go, how could that be oh. relevant beyond just the most minute thing? Oh. Um, and even probably not then. Oh. And so without getting any more into it, yeah. uh, I'll oh. leave that there. But it's a tell to me that like I don't think you know what you're trying to claim or oh, wait 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 james white doesn't think he knows what he's saying and someone knows greek will see through his charade oh. this is just a, a a sign to people that that i know greek or something like that when really you're not saying no. anything of substance and that argument wouldn't oh. make sense Whatever your argument is, I can't it's just too my, minute of a point. This Do you actually understand? One more time. How could that be relevant beyond just the most minute thing? Um, and even probably not then. And so without getting any more into it, yeah. uh, I'll leave that there. But it's a tell to me that like I don't think you know what you're trying to claim. Ooh. Or this is just a, a, a sign to people that, that I know Greek or something like that when really – you're not saying anything of substance and that argument wouldn't make sense. Whatever your argument is, it's just too minute of a point. Do you actually understand how, how language works, how you can communicate things in multiple ways and mean the same thing. And that exegesis usually doesn't almost never um, bends or and breaks upon a participle or a finite verb or something Ooh, like that. Interesting. That was a long okay. rant there. Uh, yeah. I, for no, some people, might that, that might have been a bit, a bit over their heads, but uh, it's going to be a consistent thing here. Consistent thing. Two more minutes, guys, and we go into topic. Now, remember, this is the first part in the series. Uh, so you saw that, right? No one's impressed by James White anymore. So, guys, you need to do your part. Warn people about people like James White, Matt Slick, and Anthony Rogers. They're frauds. Now, I do like Matt Slick, but he's still a fraud and he's a false teacher. May he repent. James White is bad, but Anthony, what makes him even more evil is that he's a slanderous, incarcerated criminal who has no dignity, no respect. He's garbage. <clears throat> he's trash. He's a lowlife. He's still a criminal. May the Lord continue to expose them. But now, two more minutes and we go into the topic. It's going to be a series, Lord willing. And we'll get into the meat and matter. So I will retitle this. So just be patient with me. Okay, so uh, we got a commenter. He's, a, he's also a YouTuber. Uh, good guy. So uh, he says, uh, White's point about the participle was in response to people who said that it's not passive because it's not in a, uh, I guess, masculine plural voice, which is middle passive true. voice. Okay, uh, which is trivially, trivially true to anyone who knows Greek. Um, and he has another comment on it. But does that make sense? Uh, he would say that. No, I don't think that's what – in the debate itself, I did not see that. Um, I didn't see anyone ask anything about the middle passive, um, middle or passive. One more minute, um, three seconds. Yeah, so yeah. I don't so remember that being statement. the case. So, yeah, um, maybe he's responding to people that, um, you know, have, like have used that as an argument in the past kind of thing. Hmm. Um, yeah, if that's the case, that still doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> oh, if it's the difference between an active – Oh. And a passive, oh. um, I like the uh, the voice of the verb argument in the past kind of Listen. thing. Hmm. Um, yeah, if that's the case, that still doesn't matter. What? It doesn't matter. What? One more minute, guys. It doesn't matter. But wait, this is the great Jimmy Jamila Muhammad White. The 11th Archangel sent down to lead the church to the right path, dude. Who the heck do you think you are, professor? Just because you got a legitimate degree by bona fide scholars and you are a professor at Northwest Seminary, who do you think you are, dude? You're just a kid. How dare you talk back to Jimmy White? Um, if it, The difference between an active and a passive, um, I like the... Uh, the voice of the verb Good to see um, it, it doesn't uh it doesn't matter necessarily if i say uh so, so i can use an active verb and not have any like if we're talking about volition here i, I think that's what they're getting at i'm not quite sure with this comment is that uh, without getting them to answer it uh, like you could use an active verb like he receives a punch to the face active verb um so that's an active verb receive and he's receiving a punch to the face there's no like volition or anything despite it being an active verb 
So I'm not sure if that's what he's responding to. The mid middle passive active, it doesn't matter. That 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 that's just that's so rudimentary to to language. Anyways, we should we should move beyond the, the language nitpicking stuff. Okay. Um. He also said this. Let me know if that seconds, changed anything. We're done. Uh, he didn't say it was passive because it was a parcel, but that it could still be as a parcel, just despite not being in a uh, passive voice. That's all. Okay, listen. Uh, he's well. It wouldn't be that it is passive, but rather he's saying he'd be saying that the the action being described, the semantics, not the grammar of it, but the semantics. Like, what does it mean? He the, the meaning would be uh, something passively happening to somebody. That's what he I, he does say that. We'll get there. I think we are going to we're, we're going to talk about that. All right, okay. that's All it. Right. Clips were done. So you know where to find it. Let me show you where to find this. You go to the community channel. So you go here. You click on community, and it's right there, the initial response. And then watch up the follow-up response with Leighton Flowers. Make these videos go viral on their channel and show the world. It's over for James White. Now, again, I pray I practice what I preach. I pray that if he repents, we show him compassion. But he's not repenting. He's doubling down. He actually attacked this man, tried to discredit him. And by the way, I'm not lying. James White got his doctorate at a diploma mill. And from what I know, you can do a search. From what I know, that diploma mill shut down. There is a Christian Egyptologist who did a video exposing James White's excuse for not getting a legitimate doctorate in bona fide schools of learning. This Christian, he's got a channel. It's all about the evidence for the Exodus. I forget his name. Next time when I come, I'll share the link. He goes, no, this is all excuse making. Brethren, it's over for James White. Now, by the way, I'm not a scholar, but I know languages work. I speak. I knew that when the writers are inspired by the Spirit, they're not intentionally determining to use an aorist tense over, let's say, a present active participle. You understand what I'm getting at? They're speaking as the Holy Spirit moves them to speak and write. Therefore, when you have someone who will take every nook and cranny and try to parse it, you know this man is trying to get attention. And you know this man wants to be considered as this depository of knowledge. It's an ego thing. Honestly, do you think when John or Paul are speaking, they're thinking, hold on, when I say this sentence, I'm going to use the present active participle, or I'm going to use the aorist or the perfect, because I want them to get the tense of the verb. So later on, some Americans who don't know Greek or Hebrew, but pretend they do, they're going to start parsing the verbs and trying to make me say something more than I intended. Now, that doesn't mean that these verbs don't have importance. They do, but not always. When someone overdoes it, you know they got issues. May God save us from that and destroy the beams in our eyes. Are you with me there? So. He's done. It's over with. It's it, After these series of debates, he's done. It's over with. Okay? Forget about him. He's done. James White is useless. Anthony Rogers is done too, and I'm going to make sure of it by the power of the Holy Spirit. So now we're going to start. This is part one. I'm going to use John Calvin to demolish Anthony Rogers on the doctrine of limited atonement. So let me show you how you can find these articles again. If you go to my channel here, you're going to see, I'm going to walk you through it. You go to answering Islam, answering Islam blog .wordpress.com. All you do is put in words in the search engine and read. So I'll put John Calvin atonement, John Calvin and atonement articles. I wrote showing why limited atonement is a lie. There you go. You see, that's how Judas Iscariot refutes Calvinism. You see it. Let me enlarge it a little more. And then we're going to do part two. Now, don't forget, Lord willing, I'm back on later at 11 p.m. New York time on Praise I Am channel to help him demolish Sean Griffin on the Trinity. So go there and let's pray for him because he's he's shown his willingness to change. He was a modalist who was an evolutionist who's now a Trinitarian, young earth creationist. Let's give him the benefit of the doubt. You never know who come to the fullness of the truth. So you just put in the search engine and you're going to see this. Limit atonement. And then when you get there, you click on older posts. And here's the one we're going to use. And I use this material against Matt Slick to school him. And I want to be doing series now. This will be another series. And I'll try to finish the Christmas story by the weekend, Lord willing. This is the one. 
John Calvin and Partic Redemption. It's in the description box. Okay. I'm going to use John Calvin because they call themselves Calvinists or Reformed Christians. They don't like the term Calvin because Calvin wasn't Reformed enough for their tastes. So here's the article. Let me explain limited atonement because I'm going to now. This is the Achilles heel of Tulip, the system, which is why that fat cow, Anthony Rogers, didn't want to debate me on it. He wanted to debate me on the sovereignty of God. I said, let's first debate limited atonement. Then I'll bury you on your butchering of what the Bible teaches on the sovereignty of God. I've already told Donnie of Standing for Truth to reach out to him. Let's see if he takes it because I'm going to take him out. I'm going to treat him like a Muslim by the power of the Holy Spirit. And may Lord give me humility to do it for the glory of Christ, not for my ego. <clears throat> but anyway, <clears throat> let me tell you what Calvinists came up with. They say God's shock actually taught this, but he was condemned. <clears throat> and you're going to see that in John Calvin's commentary, he doesn't affirm this at all. And I got to be careful. Not all Calvinists believe this. The Calvinism of James White, Matt Slick, Anthony Rogers, they teach what's called, I need you to listen, limited atonement, which is what I was taught and I believe. And I did series already on this where I used John Calvin to refute James White. I'll show you. Limited atonement. These are the terms. Also known as definite atonement. I asked them, standing for truth, to call him out because I want to get this fat pig, Calvinist Porker, and end his credibility. I've already done it, but I want to do it finally. He needs to be taken out. He's a he's a tool of the devil and a slanderer. He's no Christian. Now, I pray he repents, and then we'll forgive him. Okay, definite atonement. It's also called particular redemption. Sadly, I was convinced this was biblical, but you see, God is merciful, brethren. God is merciful. Exactly. He knows your heart and waits patiently to draw you by the Spirit. <clears throat> but I need you to listen now. Talk about a satanic teaching. Now that I see it, I thank the Lord for saving me from it. This is the view that teaches that Christ died only for the elect. When Christ came into the world, he didn't die for all human beings. He only died for the elect, those chosen from eternity to turn to Christ, be saved by Christ, and preserved for Christ. He only died for them. He didn't die for everyone. In other words, let's say your daughter is not elect. Jesus didn't die for her. Your father is not elect. Jesus didn't die for him. But since none of us know who the elect are, you can't go around telling people, Jesus loved you and died for you, because that's not true. That's not true. This is what they teach. And you want to consider these men Christians? Now, let me be careful. There are many people who are Calvinists that are sincere, but they've been deceived into thinking Calvinist is true, and they're not happy Calvinists. They're not. They struggle. God have mercy on them, and I do believe there are believers among them that the Lord will have mercy on. But when you have someone like Anthony Rogers or Matt Slick and James White, they're not the same as these people. You don't treat them as such. They're false teachers, tools of the devil, have no pity for them. They're not Christians. They're not Christians. I'm being honest with you. So this view teaches Christ died for those individuals. Those individuals, listen to me, that God already predestined to be saved when the Spirit comes upon them, enables them to trust in Christ and are united to Christ and preserved for Christ. God knows the number of those people, and they're the only ones that Christ died for. Now, not every Calvinist believes this. There have been Calvinists throughout the history that condemned this teaching. So I want you to be clear. Not all Calvinists believe in limited atonement. Thank God. There are many who say no. Bruce Ware, I've been told, he's a four-point Calvinist. He thinks Christ died for everyone. Are you with me there? But what a wicked, satanic teaching from the pit of hell. Can you believe this cancer is accepted among Protestantism? Why? Just because John Calvin was part of the Protestant Reformation and Calvinist, you're going to now dignify and saying it's an acceptable view within Christianity? Who said so? Who said so? You said so? This is what limited atonement, also called definite atonement, particular redemption teaches. 
It's wicked, man. That means I can't tell my daughters. I'm not trying to be emotional, but you got to be emotional, right? It's because this is a, it has implications. I can't look at my daughters and say to them, Jesus died for you because he loves you. I don't know that. They might not be elect. You with, me, you with me there, right? This is a cancer foisted on the church by Satan, but Jesus Christ Almighty, he is the healer. He's Almighty over Satan. May he destroy this cancer. You can't say it to people. You cannot tell people, if you believe in limited atonement, that Christ died for you. You don't know that. You can say Christ died for sinners. Christ died to save sinners. Christ died to procure salvation for sinners. But you can't make it personal. Yeah. And Jeff Durbin, Jamil Muhammad White's puppet, teaches this. And I used to, but I didn't know any better. But when you're confronted with facts and refuted and you still are stubborn, then you have no excuse. And by the way, if you want to find where where you can find i did already sessions where i used john calvin against james white again you go here we're going to come back in a minute so you go here to my channel use the magnifying glass you put in calvin james white okay calvin james white calvin james white james white narcissistic god and calvinism exposed james white's war against john calvin the reformers May the Lord help me to look that thin again. Yeah, Adam Sheikh, I pray on virginity. James White Chief Shot and Matt Slick Trinitarian Blunders. James White swore with John Calvin on the atonement. Pray I get healthier and holier, not be vain. So there you go. Just it. Just put in Calvin James White. Or here, if you want to find something about the Holy Spirit. So it is what you do. You just put in, okay, hold on. Here, Holy Spirit. That's it, guys. Very easy. Boom. Look what comes up. The understanding of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Okay, so you guys know how to use it, right? Okay, so now let's go to the article. Make it easy. Don't ask me when you can find it. Just search, guys. Don't be too lazy, man, because you're killing me. Now let's begin. This is going to be part one. So you go to older posts, and we're going to do a part two and three, and Lord, one other topics. I'll try to do at least one response a week to this guy, maybe a little more, maybe one other one tomorrow. We'll see, Lord willing. So what am I going to show now? Now, here's what I'm going to accomplish. Lord willing, by the grace of the Lord. You guys okay for another 30 minutes? All right. Another 30, 40 minutes? Because I'm going to do a series. I'm going to quote John Calvin's commentary on these passages that God used to bring me out of Calvinism. The reason why I'm challenging the cow to debate me in Lemontone, because he knows this is the Achilles heel of Calvinism. If you destroy limited atonement and show it's not scriptural, you're going to create doubts in the heart of a Calvinist. Well, hold on. If limited atonement is wrong, what else is wrong among their system? And that starts the avalanche. That's how I started questioning Calvinism until I saw it's not scriptural. Glory to God. Thousands and thousands of Calvinists are leaving Calvinism. Glory to God. Now, let me repeat so you don't slander me. There are believers born of the Spirit who are Calvinist in spite of their Calvinism, and they're not happy about it. They're not happy, but they've been duped into thinking, well, this is who God is. I have to live with it. Right? But they need to be shown this is not who God is. So now, John Calvin, and isn't it ironic they call themselves Calvinists? Let me show you that even their spiritual father, because Anthony is a bastard seed of John Calvin. He doesn't go back to the apostles. He has no continuity with the early church. So we're now going to use Calvin. And I'm going to look at what he says about John. And I link to, I link to, well, we'll start here. We'll just go in order. I link to the commentary online. So his commentary is online. So if you go here, there it is. Now the link has changed, but you can find it here. You can go to Bible study tools and find it. But be that it may, they change the link on me again. Ah, these people. They keep doing it. Let me see if I find the exact link. Hold on. Here it is. Bible study. Here you go here. There it is. Right there. So I give you the link. So you ready to learn? Now, by the way, I, I did this with James White. I was going to do it again because James White butchered Hebrew 7. And I'm going to butcher his butchering of Hebrew 7. Learn not to respect these guys. They don't know the Bible. And if you want to see that Anthony doesn't know the Bible, go watch my response to him. He doesn't know the Bible. He doesn't know how terms are used in the Bible. He doesn't even understand the nature of the Trinity from Scripture. He doesn't. Be that as it may, 
Isaiah 53. Let's see what Calvin said. So we're going to let me see how far we'll go into it. All right, I'm going to read only two sections. We're going to read what he says in Isaiah 53 and the Synoptic Gospels, and that'll be the end of part one. But let me remind you, Lord willing, I'll be on Praise I Am's channel, Lord willing, to talk about destroying Sean Griffin on the <clears throat> deity of Christ. So come and join me. And he promised me it's going to be strict. No intruders, no trolls, because he wants me to help him. So let me get you that link. One second. The I am. So let's do it. And then I'll retitle this. All right. Oh, wow. He's already he's already on live. Huh? He's, he's premiering my episode. Glory to God. Good man. I hope. He's, he's premiering the session I did with him. Glory to God. Father, Son, Spirit. So here it is. We're going to show you when we're going live. Here it is. This is it, the after show. Here you go. This is it. I want to show it to you. Here's the link. All right. Here's the link. That's the link for the show. Lord will now be there. Pray. Because he's now premiering the session I did with him. This is it. This other demon. All right. Now, let's begin. Jean, what do you say about Isaiah 53? Remember, they say that Christ died only for the elect. Now, Anthony, who's the bastard child of Anthony uh, of John Calvin, goes against his father. Here is Calvin in his own words. Are you ready? Here is Calvin in his own words. Here you go. Isaiah 53, 6. We see that here none are accepted, for the prophet includes all. The whole human race would have perished if Christ had not brought relief. Did you catch it? Unlike Anthony, his father says Jesus died for the whole human race. You with me there? All right. Pay attention. Use the material. Say, hey, I don't need to debate you. It's like when a Muslim. I don't need to defend the Bible. Your prophet Muhammad defends the Bible for me, so let Muhammad bury you. That's what you tell Anthony. Say, hey, fat boy, and go watch James, uh, Matt Slick's reaction when I quoted John Calvin. He goes, Calvin said that? You don't know that Calvin said it and you're a Calvinist, dude? Go see it. My debate's on my channel. So you say, Anthony, I'll just let your father, Calvin, spank you as the redheaded stepchild, the legitimate bastard child that you are. The whole human race. He does not even accept the Jews. He doesn't exclude the Jews, whose hearts were puffed up with a false opinion. Even the wicked Jews, he's in, they're included, of their own superiority, but condemns them indiscriminately, along with others, to destruction. By comparing them to sheep, he intends not to extenuate their guilt, as if little blame attached to them, but to state plainly that it belongs to Christ to gather from their wanderings those who resemble brute beasts. Everyone had turned to his own way. This is Isaiah 53. Does this mean everyone, all humans, or only the elect? By adding the term everyone, he descends from a universal statement in which he included all to a special statement. That every individual may consider in his own mind, if it be so. For a general statement produces less effect. When I just speak generally, it may not affect you when I make it personal. When I say, you, you've gone astray. That's what he's saying here. That to know that it belongs to each of us in particular. Let everyone, therefore, arouse his conscience and present himself before the judgment seat of God that he may confess his wretchedness. Now, I'm not going to read all of it. I'm going to read the bold parts. Okay, right here. He does not speak of works only, but of nature itself, which also leads us astray. For if we could by natural instinct or by our own wisdom bring ourselves back into the path or guard ourselves against going astray, Christ would not be needed by us. We wouldn't need Jesus if we could do it. Thus in ourselves, we all are undone unless Christ sets us free. Hope you're enjoying this. Use Calvin to bury these Bible butchers. And the more we re rely on our wisdom or industry, the more dreadfully and the more speedily do we draw down destruction on ourselves. And so the prophet shows that we are before we are regenerated by Christ, what we are before he regenerated for all are involved in the same condemnation. There's none righteous, none that understand it, none that seeketh God. Anyway, since we're all condemned because we're all sinners, what does Jesus come to do? Yet I approve of the ordinary reading 
that he alone bore the punishment of many, because on him was laid the guilt of the whole world, not just the elect. It is evident from other passages, and especially from the fifth chapter of the Epistle to the Romans, that many sometimes in the notes all. You know why this is ironic, folks? You know why this is ironic? Because you'll hear James White and Anthony Rogers say, all doesn't mean everyone. It can mean all types of people, all classes of people. And many doesn't mean everyone. Yet their father, John Calvin, taught the opposite. That here, many means everyone. Many means all of them. Because it's telling you how many the all are. When I say all the classroom went to Disney. Well, how many were there? Oh, there was only a few, five. Oh, no, there are many. There's like a thousand. So what he's saying is, yes, Christ died for the whole human race. And the whole human race includes many people. See it? Now we're going to go into what he says about the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And then in part two, we'll see what he says about John. Mark 14, 24, this is my blood. Again, shed for many, right? I don't want to read. He's too lengthy. We're going to get to the salient point, which is shed for many. By the word many, he means not a part of the world only, but the whole human race. Tell me this is not destruction. The whole human race. And then I'm going to go into exegesis of these texts, Lord willing. The whole human race. He contrasts many with one. It's not just one. The many means there's a lot. The whole human race consists of a lot. All right, Matthew 26, 39. What does he say here? This is when Jesus asked the Father to take the cup away from him. Here, Calvin, dude. I guess Calvin wasn't a Calvinist, or he wasn't a Calvinist enough, or he wasn't reformed enough. Okay, watch here. When he saw the wrath of God exhibited to him as he stood at the tribunal of God, charged with the sins of the whole world. This is blasphemous. We don't believe in penal substitutionary atonement. It's blasphemous. Thank you, Lord, for saving me from that. He unavoidably shrunk with horror from the deep abyss of death. Okay, now let's scrape right here. Those men, therefore, deny that Christ prayed that the Father rescue them from the guilt of death. Ascribe to him a cowardice that would be disgraceful even an ordinary man. Anyway, be that as it may. What about Luke 2.10? Luke 2.10. Okay. Which shall be to all people, the people. Though the angel addresses the shepherds alone, yet he plainly states that the message of salvation, which he brings is of wider extent, so that not only they in their private capacity may hear it. Now watch. Calvin wasn't a Calvinist, I guess. He was a bad Calvinist. Wasn't reformed enough. But that others may also hear. Now, let it be understood that this joy was common to all people because it was indiscriminately offered to all. You like it? Calvin, huh? But watch here. For God had promised Christ not to one person or to the another, but to the whole seed of Abraham. But wait, if James White and Anthony Rogers are... Right? No. Only the elect from the seed of Abraham, and that's not everyone. But no, it says the whole seed of Abraham, all of them. If the Jews were deprived for the most part of the joy that was offered to them, it arose from their unbelief. Christ came for them, but it's their fault they don't believe. Ironically, even though he believes they're dead in sin and cannot believe. That's Calvinist double talk. Just as at the present day, right now, right now, when I'm writing, God invites all indiscriminately to salvation through the gospel. But the ingratitude of the world is the reason why this grace, which is equally offered to all, is enjoyed by few. You just buried James White. You just buried Anthony Rogers. You just buried Matt Slick. That's John Calvin. This is what I call Calvinism, Calvinist Dilemma 101. Calvinist Dilemma 101. All right. Although this joy is confined to a few persons, yet with respect to God, it is said to be common. <clears throat> yeah, because a few persons are the elect, 
even though God extends it to everyone. That's what he's saying. When the angel says that this joy shall be to all the people, he speaks of the chosen people only, meaning in that context, it's referring to all of Israel. But even in that, Calvinism teaches that only the elect Israelites, not all Israelites will be saved. But now that the middle wall of partition has been thrown down, the same message has reference to the whole human race. For Christ proclaims peace, not only to them that are nigh, but to them that are afar off, to strangers, equally citizens. But as a peculiar covenant with the Jews lasted till the resurrection of Christ, so an angel separates them from the rest of the nations. That ends part one. Let me get you the article again. Lord willing, we'll do part two tomorrow. Okay, so I hope you're going to enjoy the series. We're going to just jump into it. I won't need to play clips. I hope you still benefit it, learn, and I hope it was still enjoyable. Okay, there is the article. It's in the description box. Now, don't forget, I'm going to be on, Lord willing, in two hours. We're on in two hours. Okay, two hours and minutes. Right here, click on it. Let me show it to you. Pray it goes well because I'm going to dem demolish this anti-Trinitarian heretic. And pray that praise I am comes to the fullness of the truth. So there you go. I hope you're blessed. I gave you the link to that. Lord willing to ours, pray for my health, my safety, security, my daughters. God grant us miraculous safety, security, protection, and health. I get healthier, not get sick. Pray for our holiness to love Jesus and glorify Jesus. And pray the Lord will bless the ministry financially. And I finish the race. So we're done. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope it was a blessing. Hope you learned. Hope you saw James White is a fraud. So is Anthony. They're not Christians. I'm letting you know. God, forgive me if I'm wrong. May you convict me. They're not believers. They're your enemies. They preach a false gospel. Now they can repent. Do not treat them as believers. They're more dangerous than Muslims because they claim to be Christians. Those are the most dangerous, the false brethren. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will return physically and bodily. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Wash us in your blood. Fill us with your love. Fill our loved ones, my daughters and mothers you love, and wash them in the blood that you shed and seal us by the Spirit to love you, Father, Son, and Spirit, in Jesus' name. And by the way, go see this movie. Go see this movie. In fact, let me show it to you. Right here. Let me go here. Let me go to what do you mean? He did a review of it. Go watch this movie about Mother Cabrini. I was in tears, a Catholic saint, the first American Catholic saint canonized. She's a patron saint of immigrants. You will be in tears. True story. Okay. And it's because he did a review of it that I went and saw it. I didn't even know about it. I didn't expect this. Here it is. Go watch. Ultimate nitric oxide. Right, let me get you the link. We're not going to play it. I'm just going to show it to you, and I'm going to give you a link. Make these movies financially successful so they can do more of them. Here it is. She is a saint. Mother Cabrini, pray for us. You are glorified in the presence of Jesus. There you go. Go see the movie. Mother Cabrini. Right? It's called Cabrini. The new movie from Angel Studios, Cabrini, is scheduled to release a couple weeks. It already, already came out. I was in tears. I couldn't stop crying. Go honor her. She's alive with Jesus. She did great work for orphans. She reflected the heart of Christ. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for these holy servants, saints, <clears throat> martyrs, theologians. May we be filled with the Spirit as you filled them to glorify you as they, <clears throat> they did. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus Christ. We love you, Holy Spirit. Christ is risen, risen indeed. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus, Maranatha. Take care, guys. See you in a couple hours.